Now a hearing on mortgage lenders Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. Both companies, known as government-sponsored entities, or GSEs, were chartered by the federal government. In September, the federal government assumed control of Fannie and Freddie after they took large losses in subprime loans. This hearing was held by the House Oversight and Government Reform Committee. It's about four hours, ten minutes. examine the bankruptcy of Lehman Brothers, the fall of AIG, and the role of credit rating agencies. We held a hearing with federal regulators and one with the nation's most successful hedge fund managers. Today's hearing will focus on the collapse of two government-sponsored mortgage financing enterprises, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. On September 7, the Treasury Department took control over Fannie and Freddie. The companies have now been given access to $200 billion in capital from the federal government. Our job today is to examine why Freddie and Fannie failed. As part of our investigation, the committee obtained nearly 400,000 documents from Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. These documents show that the companies made irresponsible investments that are now costing federal taxpayers billions of dollars. One key document is a confidential presentation from the files of Fannie Mae CEO Daniel Mudd. According to this document, the company faced a strategic crossroads in June of 2005. The document states, we faced two stark choices, one, stay the course, or two, meet the market where the market is. Staying the course meant focusing predominantly on more secure prime and fixed rate mortgages. The presentation explained that this option would, quote, maintain our strong credit discipline and protect the quality of our book. But according to the confidential presentation, the real revenue opportunity was in buying subprime and other alternative mortgages. To pursue this course, the company would have to, quote, accept higher risk and higher volatility of earnings, end quote. This presentation recognized that homes were being utilized like an ATM. It acknowledged that investing in subprime and alternative mortgages would mean higher credit losses. And increased exposure to unknown risks, but the lure of additional profits proved to be too great. The documents make clear that Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac knew what they were doing. Their own risk managers raised warning after warning about the dangers of investing heavily in the subprime and alternative mortgage market, but these warnings were ignored. In 2004, Freddie Mac's chief risk officer sent an email to CEO Richard Siren urging Freddie Mac to stop purchasing loans with no income or asset requirements as soon as practicable. The risk officer warned that mortgage lenders were targeting borrowers, borrowers who would have trouble qualifying for a mortgage if their financial position were adequately disclosed and that the, quote, potential for the perception and the reality of predatory lending with this product is great. But Mr. Siren did not accept the chief risk officer's recommendation. Instead, the company fired him. A year later, on November 10, 2005, a top Fannie Mae official warned, quote, our conclusion has consistently been that the layering of risk in many of these private label securities has not adequately been reflected in their pricing, end quote. On October 28, 2006, Fannie's chief risk officer sent an email to company CEO Daniel Mudd warning about a serious problem at the company. He wrote, quote, there is a pattern emerging of inadequate regard for the control process, 
end quote. In another email on July 16, 2007, the same risk officer wrote to Mr. Mudd again, this time complaining that the Board of Directors had been told falsely that, quote, we have the will and the money to change our culture and support taking more credit risk, end quote. The risk officer wrote, I have been saying that we are not even close to having proper control processes for credit, market, and operational risk. I got a 16 percent budget cut. Do I look stupid? But these warnings were routinely disregarded. In one 2007 presentation, the management of Fannie Mae told the board, quote, we want to go down the credit spectrum. Subprime spreads have widened dramatically to their widest level in years. We do not feel there is much risk going down to AA and A. We don't expect to take losses at AA and A level. Eventually, we want to go to triple B. We want to move quickly while the opportunity is still here. Taking these risks proved tremendously lucrative for Fannie and Freddie's CEOs. They made over $30 million between 2003 and 2007, but their irresponsible decisions are now costing the taxpayers billions of dollars. At an earlier hearing, the minority Republican, Republicans released a report that called Fannie and Freddie, quote, the central cancer of the mortgage market, which has now metastasized into the current financial crisis." End quote. The next day, John McCain made a similar statement during a presidential debate in Nashville, stating that, quote, Fannie and Freddie were the catalysts, the match that started this forest fire, end quote. The documents do not assert, the documents do not support these assertions. The CEOs of Fannie and Freddie made reckless bets that led to the downfall of their companies. Their actions could cost taxpayers hundreds of billions of dollars, but it is a myth to say they were the originators of the subprime crisis. Fundamentally, they were following the market, not leading it. It is also a myth to blame the nation's affordable housing goals. The bulk of Fannie and Freddie's, Freddie's credit losses, nearly $12 billion so far this year, all are the result of their purchases of Alt-A loans and securities. Because many of these risky loans lack full documentation of income, they did not help the companies meet their affordable housing goals. At today's hearing, we will have the opportunity to question four former CEOs of Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, and I thank them for their cooperation. I also want to thank the companies themselves for cooperating with the committee's investigation. But I especially want to thank and congratulate the members of this committee for their work in this Congress. This will be the last full, com full committee hearing we will hold this year, and it will be the last oversight committee hearing that I will chair. It has been a tremendous honor to chair this committee. We began our oversight efforts in Fe February of 2007 with four days of back-to-back -back hearings on waste, fraud and abuse in Federal spending. We investigated the missing $8 billion in cash handed out in Iraq, the actions of Blackwater's private security guards, the politicization of Federal science, high drug prices and CEO pay. We took testimony from Valerie Plame and Condoleezza Rice. Kevin Tillman and Donald Rumsfeld, Roger Clemens and Brian McNamee, and dozens of corporate and government leaders. And our actions were the catalyst for legislative changes that will save the taxpayers billions of dollars. It has been a busy schedule, but the one constant that has been the, the one constant of all this has been the dedication and commitment of the members of the committee. Oversight is not easy. To have an impact, you have to work hard and know your facts, and that is what the members have done in hearing after hearing. I will always be proud of the work of this committee and even prouder of the members with whom I have had the great uh, fortune to serve. I know that this committee will do great things next year under the leadership of your new chairman and your new ranking member, 
and I want you to know that I will miss being here, and it has been a tremendous privilege for me to serve with you. I now want to recognize the ranking member of the committee, Mr. Issa, for his opening statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, before I begin, I would ask unanimous consent that uh, my colleagues from Financial Services, the ranking member, Mr. Bacchus and Mr. Garrett of uh, New Jersey, would be permitted to participate in this hearing today. Without objection, that will be the order. Mr. Chairman, I additionally ask unanimous consent uh, that documents produced pursuant to the request by the Committee, including certain emails, memorandum, and presentations of uh, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, be inserted into the record of this hearing. Okay. Any, uh, any problems with that? Oh, can we just look at the documents first? Well, uh, if you gentlemen would withhold that unanimous con consent request, we want to just be sure we are talking about the Of course, documents. Mr. Chairman. Okay. Thank you. Mr. Please. Chairman, also before I, I begin, uh, on behalf of uh, Ranking Member Tom Davis, who, as you know, has, uh, has now left the Congress uh, just slightly early, uh, I have had the honor of serving with you and serving with Mr. Davis for these uh, last two years. Uh, although we have not always agreed, uh, matter of fact, we have not often agreed, the elevation of this committee by your tireless effort has, in fact, put this committee where it should be, at the center of Congress's oversight of this large uh, economy, both public and private. And for that, this committee will owe you, and hopefully the picture to be hung soon, uh, a debt of gratitude, because to elevate a committee is one of the hardest things in the world to do. Many chairmen spend years at the helm of a committee and see it reduced or, at best, held the same. But you truly have left this committee much stronger than when you found it. And for that, both sides of the aisle will always be grateful. Thank you, Mr. Mr. Issa, would, would you, uh, well, Mr. Issa, would you yield to me for I'd just I yield to the gentleman. Well, you know, I think uh, one of the reasons Mr. Waxman has probably sought the position on financial services, uh, uh, Ener I'm sorry, energy and commerce. Used to be part of energy and commerce. Uh, yeah, it used to be. But it uh, was uh, to, ex to escape uh, the clause of uh, Mr. Isa and Mr. Micah, but uh, we wish him well in his new uh, endeavor. Uh, two things. One, uh, there is no substance, as I told you before, to the fact that our, our steering committee is moving the two of us over to that uh, committee. So, you, uh, that will be very good. And also, uh, could you please keep me posted on the exact date of the hanging of Henry Waxman, because I want to be here for it. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your indulgence, Mr. Chairman. Gentlemen's time has expired. No, you <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for scheduling this, this important hearing. Uh, and thank you again for the uh, second panel of expert witnesses. That shows a great deal of, of bipartisan cooperation. And, and for that, again, I am grateful. Uh, as we attempt to deal with the ongoing finance, financial crisis, it is critical that we look at all the factors that cause the collapse of the financial system. The one thing we know for certain is that the overinflated housing market and defaulting subprime loans are at the center of the problem. And it is no secret that I believe that Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac had either the primary role or certainly a primary cause of this uh, failure. The analogy of the Chicago fire and Mrs. O'Leary's cow is particularly appropriate here. The cow was the immediate cause of the fire, but there were a number of factors that made the fire inevitable. The fire spread quickly because homes were densely packed and made of wood. It, it wasn't a question of whether the disaster would happen, but when. I believe that Freddie and Fanny had a great deal to do with packing that great deal of wood close together for a number of years. These two government-sponsored enterprises were repeatedly urged by politicians to deliver affordable housing to the American people. There was an inevitability in this policy, just as the events that led to the Chicago fire. Traditional home loans were replaced with easy credit, no document, and no down payment loans. Instead of human judgment assessing risk, 
those responsibilities were shifted to rely on computer modeling. Outright fraud and greed wasn't isolated to just Wall Street, although I appreciate the Chairman's work on un uncovering the portion that was in Wall Street. Fannie and Freddie shared in this disgrace as it drove much of the poor decision making that have led us to where we are here today. Mr. Chairman, the time for double talk, not in this committee, but outside this committee, is over. Mr. Chairman, the election is behind us. So let us get to the bottom of this crisis and find out what really happened. We must work together to get to the root causes of this crisis, not just a root cause, but all root causes. It is important that we find out what factors interacted with each other to bring about the degree of financial destruction. Of all the work we have done to date, it is inconceivable that we have not had any discussion of the role that we played, the role of congressionally mandated policies played in this crisis. We must ask ourselves, did Congress advocate policies that fermented this crisis? Did individual Congressmen and or women advocate because, in fact, it was a re convenient relationship both politically and perhaps personally? Some will consider what I am about to say not politically correct. A few weeks ago, when the topic of uh, Freddie, Fre Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac affordable housing loans were raised as a cause of this crisis, Chairman Barney Frank said it was, a, was racist to suggest as much. I will say here today, it is not racist to suggest anything and everything as a cause of this problem until it is properly eliminated by those who are not affected directly by it, but in fact can dispassionately and objectively analyze what was or was not a cause of this problem. In a recent Senate hearing on the automobile bailout, just, uh, Chairman Christopher Dodd <coughs> continued to point a finger at Wall Street as the culprits of the current crisis and many crises. Those two men are chairman of the two most important committees, notwithstanding ours, dealing with this, the financial crisis yet they appear to be wearing blinders and want to discuss the full range and in wanting to in not wanting to discuss the full range of issues underlying this crisis mr chairman the goal of affordable housing is one of the most laudable goals we as legislators should seek to attain but we should do it in a way that does not destroy the whole financial system which is in fact what has happened let me draw a contrast for decades, under the GI Bill of Rights, we allowed and encouraged servicemen to get VA home loans with little or no money down. And that program, Mr. Chairman, works well. What I am saying is that affordable housing is, desire, is a desirable goal and it can be done the right way. But in this case, the GSEs, <clears throat> in the case of the GSEs, how we encourage the program is something we have to come to grips with. We have to recognize that what we have done with the GSEs hasn't worked. Rather, it has allowed the most vulnerable in our society to be subject to predatory lenders. We gave hope to people with the promise of home ownership without telling them the American dream could turn into their personal nightmare. Mr. Chairman, we in the con Congress have to look in the mirror because part of the blame clearly lies at our footsteps. I have introduced legislation to establish a 9-11 type independent nonpartisan commission composed of experts, not politicians, to assess what went wrong and how the system should be uh, remedied. Mr. Chairman, in your new role, I would hope that you would sign on in the next Congress as a co-sponsor of this legislation. I believe that this committee and others should continue to actively look into the causes. We should, in fact, do our oversight role. But the worst thing Congress can do now is to start legislating or activating, or excuse me, advocating for regulation without a clear nonpartisan uh, analysis of what went wrong, it, including a look inward. Business Week ran an article suggesting many of the current, just, this, just ran an article indicating that many of the current uh, reworked FHA 
loans will default in the near future and a second bailout will be necessary. Mr. Chairman, for all the committees in the Congress, this committee has a unique obligation <clears throat> and opportunity to work in a bipartisan way to follow the causes of this crisis, both independently and through a commission that can provide us with additional insight in all directions, including that which comes to our footsteps. Mr. Chairman, I would hope that we will continue in the next Congress to make sure that the Financial Services Committee does not surplant this committee in making sure that government does what it should do, not only to encourage and allow home ownership to all, but in fact to protect the financial uh, system that today is teetering on, a, on the edge of a yet another precipitous fall. If the Congress cannot do this in an objective and dispassionate way, then I assure you the minority will, will continue to pull at every possible lever to ensure that we can play a constructive role in ensuring that the wood will not be piled up again, that homes, whether in Chicago or throughout America, will not be built close together and of wood in order to have yet another Mrs. O'Leary's fire. Mr. Chairman, thank you again for holding this important hearing, and I look forward to uh, perhaps you being an original co-sponsor of the legislation calling for a nonpartisan commission in the next Congress. Thank you, Mr. Eisner. I am pleased to introduce our witnesses today. We have Leland Brenzel, the former CEO of Freddie Mac. Uh, he worked at Freddie Mac for 21 years and left the company in June 2003. Um, Daniel Mudd, former CEO of Fannie Mae, served as the President and Chief Executive Officer of Fannie Mae from June 2005 until September 2008. Mr. Mudd was also a member of the Fannie Mae Board of Directors from February 2000 until September 2008. Franklin Raines, is the former Chief Executive Officer of Fannie Mae from 1999 until his retirement in December 2004. He previously served at Fannie Mae's, as Fannie Mae's Vice President from 1991 until 1996. And Richard Siren, as former CEO of Freddie Mac, served as the Chairman and CEO uh, from December 2003 to, to uh, September 2008. I want to welcome each of you to our uh, hearing today. It is the custom of this committee that all members that testify do so under oath, so I would like to ask if you would please stand and raise your right hand. Do you uh, solemnly swear that the testimony you will give before the committee will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? The record will indicate that each of the witnesses answered in the affirmative. Your prepared statements will be in the record uh, in its entirety. We will have a clock that will indicate uh, a time for five minutes. Four minutes will be green. The last minute will turn orange. And then when the five minutes is up, it will turn red. That will be an indication to you that uh, we would like you then to conclude your comments, even though it may not be the complete testimony. The whole testimony will already be in the record. Um, any particular order? Uh, we will start with you. Mr. Uh, Siren, why don't we start with you? There is a button on the base of the mic. Be sure to push it and have the mic close enough so that it can be picked up. Uh, thank you, uh, Chairman Waxman and uh, members of the committee. Uh, I appreciate pull, the. Pull the mic a little closer. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Is that better? Yes. Thank you, Chairman Waxman and members of the committee. Good morning. I appreciate the opportunity to testify today and address your issues of concern in light of the current financial crisis. Uh, as you know, I served as CEO of Freddie Mac for essentially from 2004 to September of this year. Let me start with a very basic proposition. Freddie Mac was, is, and by law must be a non-diversified financial services company limited to the business of residential mortgages. Given the recent severe nationwide downturn in the housing market, the only nationwide housing decline in housing values since the Great Depression, any company limited exclusively to the line of, uh, that line of business alone would be severely impacted. As Treasury Secretary Paulson recently noted, 
Given the GSEs were so solely involved in housing and given the magnitude of the housing correction we have had, the losses by the GSEs should come as no surprise to anyone. With respect to the housing market, the prolonged glut of credit certainly was one factor that contributed to the housing bubble and its subsequent collapse. Another important factor was the shift from a system in which mortgage originators held loans to maturity to a system in which mortgage originators immediately sold or securitized a loan and retained no risk. In more recent years, increasingly complex financial techniques were also applied to the process with the objective of minimizing, shifting, or some believed virtually eliminating risk. We all recognize that home ownership provides benefits and generates substantial social advantages beyond just shelter. We have learned the hard way, however, that the rapid expansion of home ownership is not without risk and ultimately not without cost if the choices made by individual homeowners are unaffordable. What was the role of Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac in the credit crisis? These institutions were established by Congress to promote liquidity, affordability, and stability in housing finance. They do so primarily by guaranteeing the timely payment of principal and interest on mortgages originated by banks in order to facilitate the purchase of those mortgages by institutional investors, thereby enabling banks to make new loans. Congress has reaffirmed this role for Fannie and Freddie many times, including quite recently. When the dramatic and widespread downturn in housing prices occurred, the pressures on Freddie Mac and Fannie Mae were enormous. The GSEs are a non-diversified business focused solely on residential housing in the United States. As the guarantor of almost half the home mortgages in the country, it is not surprising that these two firms would get hit hard by the biggest housing collapse in 75 years. This lack of diversification was extremely challenging for the GSEs, even though their credit standards were higher than other lenders. There has been a lot of attention in the media and elsewhere to the problems associated with the nontraditional or subprime market. And there is no question that Freddie Mac has incurred losses associated with nontraditional loans. But it is important to remember that Freddie and its sister institution, Fannie, did not create the subprime market, I think as the Chairman said. Freddie was in fact a late entrant into the nontraditional, i.e., non 30 year fixed rate conventional market, uh, such as Alt A. The subprime market was developed largely by private label participants, as were most nontraditional mortgage products. Freddie Mac entered the nontraditional slice of the market because, as the private lending sector shifted towards those types of loans, Freddie needed to participate in order to carry out its public mission of promoting affordability, stability, and liquidity in housing finance. In addition, if it had not done so, it could not have remained competitive or even relevant in the residential mortgage market we were designed to serve. Moreover, if you are going to take the mission of providing low-income lending seriously, then by definition you are going to take a somewhat greater level of risk. Freddie's delinquency rates and default rates, both overall and for each type loan, were much lower than those of the market overall and were especially lower, for lower than for mortgages underwritten by purely private institutions, many of which were severely impaired for some of the same reasons as Franny and, Fetty and Freddie. Every institution with significant exposure to residential mortgages has been negatively impacted by the generally unforeseen magnitude and volatility and rapidity in the collapse of the housing price market. Before I conclude, I just want to take a moment to recall the public mission of the GSEs. As everyone aware, Freddie Mac is a shareholder-owned corporation chartered for the purpose of supporting America's mortgage finance markets and operating under government mandates. We had obligations to Congress and to the public to promote our chartered purposes of increasing affordability, liquidity and stability in housing finance, which included some very specific low-income housing goals. But we also had obligations to our regulator to pursue our goals in a manner that was prudent and reasonable. At the same time, 
We had the fiduciary obligation to our shareholders that were identical to any other publicly traded company. Freddie Mac always worked hard to balance these multiple objectives, and for decades the company was effective. There is much to be said about the success of the GSE model, and those successes should not be totally overlooked because of the current crisis. As Congress looks to the future of residential housing finance, the GSEs can and should play an important role. I would be pleased to answer your questions about my time at Freddie Mac and any lessons that might be learned. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much, Mr. Simon. Mr. Mudd. Mr. Chairman, uh, Representative Issa, members of the committee, uh, thank you all for the opportunity to appear before you this morning. My name is Daniel Mudd. I joined Fannie Mae in 2000 following a decade at General Electric. I served consecutively as Chief Operating Officer and Interim Chief Executive Officer of Fannie Mae. In June of 2005, the Board of Directors, with the approval of our regulator, asked me to stay on as CEO complete the accounting restatement, work cooperatively with our regulator, remediate a number of control weaknesses, and restore the company's position and standing in the capital markets. The company made significant progress in these areas, returning to timely and current filings with the SEC, settling matters with AFAO and the SEC, meeting housing goals, and earning $13.3 billion of net income from 05 through mid-07. I also worked with members of this Congress to support legislation passed into law in July to create a strong world-class regulator for the GSEs. As background, I believe the roots of this crisis go back to the enormous increase in consumer and commercial leverage in the 1990s, the trend built up through 2007 when the financial sector entered what most observers view as the worst conditions ever seen in the capital markets. The GSEs were chartered by Congress to provide liquidity, affordability, and stability to the mortgage market at all times. In fact, in the midst of the present turmoil, when other companies decided not to invest, the GSEs were specifically charged to take up the slack. This had worked in several recessions, the Russian debt crisis of 1998, the aftermath of 9-11, but not, not in 2008. The housing market went into a free fall, with some predicting a decline now of as much as 30 percent from peak to trough, a business model requiring a company to continue to support the entire market could not work. Through the spring and summer of this year, my colleagues and I worked with government officials, regulators, our customers in the banking system, housing advocates, and others to maintain what was really an excruciating balance between providing liquidity to keep the market functioning, protecting Fannie Mae's regulatory capital, and advancing the interest of the company's owners. At the time the government declared conservatorship over the company, we were still maintaining regulatory capital in accord with all relevant standards, and we were still, along with Freddie Mac, the principal source of financing to the mortgage market. While I deeply respect the myriad challenges facing the Treasury Department and the regulator, I did not believe that conservatorship was the best solution in the case of Fannie Mae. I believe that more modest government support, basically a program something like uh, the banks are now eligible for, would have maintained uh, a, a better model. Admittedly, it would not have been a magic bullet, but this market seems to defy magic bullets, whether they are fired by the private sector or by the government. In any case, I think that is now water under the bridge, and the GSEs, like many other institutions, are stuck mid-crisis. I would therefore advocate moving the GSEs out of no man's land. Events have shown, events have certainly shown me, how difficult it is to balance financial, capital, market, housing, shareholder, bondholder, homeowner, public and private interests in a crisis of these proportions. We should examine whether the economy and the markets are better served by fully private or fully public GSEs. I hope we have a debate on the future structure of the housing finance market in the country before events themselves produce a fait accompli that answers this question. It is possible, I think, in all of this to forget the many positive achievements of the GSEs. We finance tens of millions of homes 
to Americans of low to moderate income. We made mortgages fairer, more transparent, and available to a broader spectrum of society. We developed colorblind underwriting. We assured the banking system that their loans would garner a predictable price around the globe 24 by 7. When asked by Congress and the administration, we stepped up and provided the only source of funding for loans in high cost areas and elsewhere. Let me end by suggesting that home ownership does remain a central dream for many Americans. I believe that once the present crisis resolves itself, owning a home will again be a way for Americans to express confidence in their future. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Mudd. Mr. Brinzel. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Representative Issa, and uh, other distinguished members of the committee. I am Leland Brenzel, and I was formerly the Chairman and Chief Executive Officer of the Federal Home Loan Mortgage Corporation, more commonly referred to as Freddie Mac. And I want to thank you for the opportunity to address this committee as you consider the future of the government-sponsored enterprises and their importance to the housing finance system in the United States of America. I believe that we have had the best housing finance system in the world and that Freddie Mac and Fannie Mae have been vital to its success and they are vital to its future. In particular, Freddie Mac and Fannie Mae have been instrumental in ensuring the continued availability of long-term fixed rate mortgage loans. And I hope this hearing and future examinations will examine the critical importance of those mortgage loans and Freddie Mac's and Fannie Mae's essential role. Before I do go further, I want to provide a little information on my background. I joined Freddie Mac in 1982 and devoted 21 years of my life to it. I left Freddie Mac in June of 2003 after more than two decades of service, and I have not had any role in the company now for over five and one half years. I do feel very fortunate to have been the leader of such a great company with such an important public mission. I was raised on a family farm in South Dakota, attended public schools in the Sioux Falls area, and after that I graduated from the University of Colorado and ultimately earned a PhD in financial economics from Northwestern University in Illinois in 1974. I spent eight years teaching and working as an economist, first at the Farm Credit Administration here in Washington and later at the Federal Home Loan Bank in Iowa. But as I mentioned, I spent the bulk of my career at Freddie Mac. When I joined it in 1982, I served as Freddie Mac's Chief Financial Officer, and then I assumed the role of Chief Executive Officer in 1985. And I was elected Chairman of the Board beginning in 1989, at the time that Freddie Mac became publicly owned and listed on the New York Stock Exchange. By the time I left Freddie Mac in 2003, the secondary mortgage market had become a major source of stability and reliability for financing housing and home ownership. Indeed, this is a tribute to the wisdom of Congress in chartering Freddie Mac with the mission of increasing the availability and affordability of mortgage credit by tapping the world's capital markets. Today, many homeowners and the secondary market certainly are in distress. Congress is rightly considering many proposals for restoring stability. And in doing so, I hope that Congress will take steps, as it has in the past, to assure the continued availability and affordability of long-term fixed-rate mortgage loans. These mortgages have not contributed in any meaningful way to the present crisis, but their survival is in jeopardy because of it. Freddie Mac was chartered in 1970 by Congress to provide stability and liquidity to the secondary market for residential mortgages. When I began Freddie Mac in 1982, the secondary market was an embryonic market and the company was still a small participant in it. At that time, in 1982, Savings and Loan Association and thrift institutions were still the primary mortgage lenders. They were portfolio lenders, but many of them had recently failed or were failing. 
The housing and mortgage markets were in turmoil, and home ownership rates, in fact, were declining at that time. A family trying to buy a home was faced with mortgage rates that swung between 13 and 17 percent alone for 30-year fixed rate mortgage loans over the course of 1982. Because there was not widespread access to the national financial markets, the availability of mortgages depended on the amount of local bank deposits that could be loaned. In addition, the mortgage application and underwriting process was arbitrary, inconsistent. There were large regional disparities in the mortgage market, and too frequently the process disfavored minority and rural communities. During the 1980s and 1990s, Freddie Mac played a major role in addressing the deficiencies in the mortgage markets. Freddie Mac broadened the potential sources of financing for residential loans. We helped preserve the 30-year fixed rate mortgage, which had fallen out of favor with many portfolio lenders. We, were dry, we drove down origination costs, made it more efficient. We improved the speed, reliability, and fairness of the underwriting process, and we increased access to mortgages for minorities and underserved communities. As a result, one of which I am proud, by 2001, two years before I left, Freddie Mac had answered Congress's call by financing homes for 30 million Americans. I still care deeply about Freddie Mac and its mission, and I share the committee's concern about how to best protect America's homeowners and communities. I thank the committee for the opportunity to be here today. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Brenzel. Mr. Raines, do you want to wait a second till the bill stop? Okay. <laughs> no, no, no. fifteen-minute warning. Okay. Please go ahead. Thank you. Uh, Chairman Waxman, Mr. Issa, and, and distinguished members of the committee, my name is Franklin Raines, and I'd like to thank the Chairman for uh, accepting my longer written testimony for, as part of the record. I have worked in the financial services and investment industry for 27 years. I have had 12 years experience in investment banking and 11 years of experience in the mortgage industry as Vice Chairman and Chairman and CEO of Fannie Mae. I was appointed chairman and CEO by an independent board of directors with 13 of its 18 members elected by public shareholders. In my six years as chairman and CEO, Fannie Mae provided over $3.4 trillion of financing serving more than 30 million low, moderate and middle income families. The company's revenue, book of business and economic value more than doubled during this period and the stock outperformed the S&P 500. On December 21, 2004, I announced my retirement from Fannie Mae and have had no management role at the company since that time. My experience in financial services, along with my tenure as the Director of the Office of Management and Budget, will form the basis for much of my testimony today. The current financial crisis has a variety of complex sources. However, in my view, it did not result from Fannie Mae's recent risk management decisions or from its accounting practices four years ago. There is no doubt that the crisis afflicting the national and international financial system is without precedent since the Great Depression. Yet the Federal Government's response, while large in dollars, has had limited success. Financial market convulsions are not a new phenomena. The past quarter century alone has witnessed the junk bond meltdown, the Internet stock implosion, and several others, including the present mortgage and credit derivatives crisis. These separate events have many features in common that I have outlined in my written statement. Fannie Mae managed to avoid the major causes of the current crisis through 2004. The company had significant experience during the 1980s and early 1990s with the impact of falling housing prices on the value of mortgages. The company was also quite familiar with the different credit performance characteristics of mortgages with certain features, such as adjustable rates or negative amortization with certain underwriting approaches, such as no documentation of assets or income, and with certain borrower types, such as marginal credit or housing speculators. The, the company undertook the quantitative research in the 1990s that showed all these features created greater credit risk. As a result, Fannie Mae developed tools to evaluate and manage the new types of mortgages that had begun to come on the market in the early part of this decade. As subprime and Alt-A loans began to grow as a share of the overall mortgage market, 
The risk management restrictions Fannie Mae had in place limited the company's involvement with those products. And as a result, in 2004, the company's share of the overall secondary market plummeted. The company's public disclosures demonstrate that the credit risk profile of Fannie Mae changed after 2004. Fannie Mae, like a lot of smart investors, expanded its appetite for credit risk. However, it is important to note that rather than lead the market toward looser credit standards, Fannie Mae generally resisted pressures to significantly lower its standards until about 2006. There have been many assertions by commentators about the role of affordable housing lending re regulation and financial services regulators as causes of the current financial crisis. There was no regulation that forced banks or GSEs to acquire loans that were so risky they imperiled the safety and soundness of the institution. The riskiest loans in the system tended to be originated by lenders not covered by the Community Reinvestment Act or the GSE affordable housing goals. On the other hand, the absence of consumer protection regulation allowed many bad loans to be made to the detriment of consumers. The question remains, why did re the regulators of banks and the GSEs not criticize or restrict the acquisition of risky loans by regulated institutions? It is remarkable that during the period that Fannie Mae substantially increased its exposure to credit risk, its regulator made no visible effort to enforce any limits. This was true even though the regulator only oversaw two companies, had greatly increased its budget, and was then enforcing a form of quasi-conservatorship on the company. Preventing future crises in the financial services industry and their attendant damage to consumers will, re will require th three things in my judgment. First, executives will have to exercise greater discipline in managing risk. Second, there needs to be a better informed regulation of large leveraged financial entities. And third, there must be greater protection of consumers from financial products they cannot reasonably be expected to understand. Finally, Mr. Chairman, the GSE model is not perfect. However, if we maintain the public goal of marshalling private capital to achieve the public purpose of home ownership and affordable rental housing, it will be hard to find a model that has more benefits and fewer demerits than the model that worked reasonably well for almost 70 years at Fannie Mae. It has been almost four years since my decisions have had any impact on Fannie Mae, the housing market, or the global market for mortgages and mortgage-backed securities. Even so, I continue to believe in the mission Congress gave to Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. I also believe these companies can play an important role in helping to solve today's mortgage financing crisis. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I would be happy to answer any questions the committee might have. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Raines. We appreciate your testimony. Uh, we're now, uh, before we go to uh, questions by the members of the committee, I'd like to ask unanimous consent that all members may be permitted to enter an opening statement into the record. And without objection, that will be the order. By a previous agreement with the uh, minority, I'd ask unanimous consent that we start off the questioning with 12 minutes uh, uh, on the Democratic side and 12 minutes on the Republican side. Uh, before we then go to the five-minute rule. And without objection, that will be the order. Uh, the Chair, starting the questions uh, for our side, would yield uh, ten minutes to the gentleman from Massachusetts, Mr. Tierney. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, before I start my questions, I just want to take one moment in appreciating your services here as Chairman. Uh, I share with Mr. Iser the observation that you have lifted the stature of this committee substantially. Uh, and all the members and the staff are grateful for that. Mm -hmm. When you were in the minority as a ranking member, you certainly uh, made every attempt and were successful in refocusing the Congress and the committee on important matters. As chairman, you have focused on a number of important matters that were essential to the country and to the Congress. Now you bring your duties and your skills over to the Commerce Committee at our loss, uh, but I think the nation and Congress is a benefit. And so we thank you very much and I am proud to serve with you. Uh, thank I will be given full ten minutes. <laughs> <laughs> I want to thank all of you gentlemen for uh, being here this morning and, and uh, working with us on this. Mr. Mudd, if, if you might, I would like to ask you a, a couple of questions, in particular about a document uh, that we found in your internal files at Fannie Mae. It says that a single family guarantee business facing strategic crossroads dated in June of 2005 and listed as confidential and highly restricted. Uh, I would like to get your responses to it. We have got some slides up there if you find that helpful, sir. The first slide in this uh, says the risk in the environment has accelerated dramatically 
And the bullets under that say that there has been a proliferation of higher risk alternative mortgage products. Uh, there is a growing concern about housing bubbles. There is a growing concern about borrowers taking on increased risk and higher debt. And lenders have engaged in aggressive risk layering. The next slide, if we switch over on that, it says growth in adjustable rate mortgages continues at an aggressive pace. And here the presentation says that there has been an emphasis on the lowest possible payment and homes are being utilized more like an ATM. Uh, it appears, Mr. Mudd, that you are aware of both the accelerating risk in this environment uh, as well as the concerns about housing bubbles as far back as 2005. Is that correct? Yes. Thank you. The next slide says we are at a strategic crossroads. And we face two stark choices. Uh, one is stay the course and the other is meet the market where the market is. The next slide shows the benefits of staying the course. It says Fannie could maintain our strong credit discipline. It would protect the quality of the book. It would intensify our public voice on concerns about the housing bubble and accelerating risks. And most importantly, it would preserve capital. The next slide shows the other alternative meet the market where the market is. In other words, you would meet current consumer and customer demands for alternative mortgage products. This was viewed as a revenue opportunity in a growth area. But under the alternative, you accept higher risk and higher volatility of earnings. And the next slide puts these pros and cons side by side. If you stay the course, you will have lower revenues and slower growth, but you have more security. On the other hand, if you invest in riskier mortgages, you have potential for high revenues and faster growth. But as the slide says, you also have increased exposure to unknown risks. Based on these slides, Mr. Mudd, you faced a fundamental decision in 2005. Do you keep your focus on the more secure fixed rate mortgages but potentially lose out on some profits? Or do you compete with private lenders by entering into riskier sectors of the market? It doesn't seem that there was any real question that you were aware that you were increasing your risk significantly by entering the market. Is that correct? Uh, no, it's not exactly correct, uh, Congressman. Okay. Are you, now, the document indicates that you were aware that you were increasing your risk. You are saying that you weren't aware you were increasing well, your risk? Well, um, if, if, if I might uh, give you, well, I'm asking uh, give you, you a response so. in context. Um, uh, the process and the, uh, what we were doing in, at that time was thinking through what our various alternatives were uh, in terms of the marketplace. Uh, the choice, as you do in, in corporations or other institutions, was presented relatively starkly in order to identify what the key issues were. But in fact, the real choice that was made on the ground was not do you do A, do you do B, do you do black, do you do red. The choice was rather what are the pros and cons of this decision to make clear what the choices were. And that is reflected the, in that document. Yes, sir. Right. And, and, the, and one of those is that you are increasing your risk significantly by entering that market if you were to enter that market. If you were to make the, 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 B, the full B decision, and, and that is not, in fact, what we did. Right. Well, so the choice was how, how far do you adjust from where you are to meet the market ultimately. Well, it, it looks as if you made the choice uh, to enter the alternative market. But let me put up two more slides and we will discuss it. Um, the, the first slide that we are going to put up is the recommendation that was made in 2005 based on all the factors you just talked about. It starts by admitting that realistically we are not in position to meet the market uh, and that is because you had less experience with the riskier loans and you didn't have enough data to evaluate the credit risks. The slide says, therefore, we recommend that we pursue a stay the course strategy. However, the slide at the bottom recommends that you dedicate resources and funding to, quote, underground efforts to develop a subprime infrastructure and modeling for alternative markets. The last slide says this. If we do not seriously invest in these underground type efforts, we risk becoming a niche player, becoming less of a market leader, and becoming less relevant to the secondary market. So, Mr. Mudd, I, I reviewed your written statement and I, I listened to what you had to say here today. You didn't seem to take any acknowledgement that you may have made some mistakes. And looking back in hindsight and directed by the slide that we just saw, you may not have led the market, and I really believe that is true. You didn't lead the market into the situation, but you faced the choice of whether to enter it. And it appears to me that you made the choice to enter that market and that was a wrong decision. Do you agree that that was a wrong decision to make? Uh, no, sir. And what, what I would point to on this slide is the, is the, is the phrase that says uh, we need to invest in these efforts uh, if the, and if the market changes proved to be secular. And uh, the context I would point out to you in that was we weren't sure 
We weren't sure whether those changes in the marketplace were secular or whether they were cyclical. Was it temporary or was it a permanent change in the market? And we thought it was important that we couldn't afford to make the bet uh, that the changes were not going to be permanent. We couldn't afford to make the bet that somebody who has a subprime mortgage, who at the end of the day is simply an American with a credit blemish, would never be able to get a loan in the country if the Fannie Mae approach, Fannie Mae standards, Fannie Mae qualities couldn't be applied there. So when we looked at the market, we made a trade-off between the choices and we said, no, we're going to focus back on our bread and butter, but we're going to do this work to make sure we understand these new emerging markets and we can develop a better view of them. But in actuality, starting in 2005, you actually purchased hundreds of billions of dollars of those loans, correct? Uh, no, sir. I think it's important in that to break out the various categories of, of loans because uh, in your question you were asking about uh, ARM loans, which are adjustable rate mor mortgages, which many of us have, um, uh, Alt-A loans, which are an, an alternative to an A loan, different documentation than an A loan, and subprime loans, which are a different matter uh, entirely. Uh, going back through those, 85 percent of the book uh, at Fannie Mae was uh, standard, uh, standard A loans, uh, the basic loans that had been done throughout time. Uh, a percentage around 10 percent or so was in the Alt-A category, and a, a much smaller percentage that never amounted to more than a percent or two of this total book was actually in subprime. Well, I think, Mr. Mudd, it's important that we make a distinction between the Alt-A and the, and the subprime uh, on that. And, and I think because of some of the rhetoric that we have heard back and forth there, the subprime, as you said, was a very small part of the portfolio? Yes. All right. Explain first the Alt-A. You didn't really get any credit, did you, on meeting your goals for affordable housing by buying the Alt-A's because, in my understanding, they are not really clarified as to just what the basis of those loans are. I am sorry, I missed the end of your question. Well, well, let me put this. Describe for us the Alt-A loans and whether or not you get any credit for those on your goals of meeting affordable housing. Uh, it would depend whether the actual character of the loan met the, uh, the uh, socioeconomic categories that would count toward a goal per se on the face they might or might not count. The Alt-A loans were essentially a subset of overall A loans, as I indicated. Alt-A means an alternative to an A loan. So they bear many of the same characteristics of an A loan. If otherwise they qualified or they counted, they might or might not count toward those affordable housing goals. The market produced those loans uh, and Fannie Mae's participant uh, in those loans, in fact, goes all the way back to 2000. We were doing in the year starting in 2000, 10 billion up to uh, in 2003 about 100 billion dollars of Alt A loans, down to 79 in 2005. Up, uh, I could go on, but those those loans kind of varied in terms of what the market was producing, as did the balance between fixed rate loans and uh, adjustable rate loans. In about June of 2005 is when you decided to go into Alt A's uh, a little bit more heavily, right? Um. We decided to examine the market more carefully. In 2004, we were doing uh, a rate of about $63 billion. In 2006, we were up to 106, and then in 2007, 98 billion. So, uh, so up to 106 in, in 2005 on that. And in this year, substantially the largest part of your losses come from those Alte loans, correct? Uh, I, 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 I'm, I'm not completely up to date on the figures, Congressman, but I think that, that, that of a single segment of the book, the largest losses come from Alt-A, but the predominance of the book, the old A rate, 85 percent of the book, is also producing about half the loans as the housing market has gone down by 30 percent. Well, I, I think, you know, just let me sum up on this. I, I don't think that Fannie Mae or Freddie Mac caused this situation by any stretch of the imagination, but I do think that not just a slide in your testimony, but the facts also indicate that you bear some responsibility for aggravating it, some responsibility for accepting those risks knowingly, uh, that those risks that were there, that they were not insignificant, in fact, they were substantial, uh, and plunging into that market, sort of following uh, onto the Wall Street gang into that. And, uh, and I think that we are all going to pay the price for that and that we are going to have to deal with that uh, now. But I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Tierney. Mr. Eisen. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. You know, I look at all four of you, and the one thing that I seem to find is that all four of you still seem to be in complete denial that Freddie and Fannie are in any way responsible for this. Your testimony says you are not accepting any blame for this at all. You are either, either standing behind the mandate of the Congress 
or the mandate of your stockholders, perhaps the mandate of your bonus packages, and you are telling us that, in fact, everyone was doing it. Your whole excuse for going to risky and unreasonable loans that are defaulting at an incredibly high rate is everyone is doing it. If we don't do it, we will be left out. Well, I am sorry that you wanted to be the most popular girl in the school and you forgot what your mother told you about your activities. Mr. Mudd, you seem to have the clearest reason, and with Mr. Tierney's questions, you seem to be able to clearly articulate something I would like to have all four of you acknowledge today, that, in fact, there are compliant, A, conventional, I met the criteria alone, and then there are all others, Alt-A and subprime being two best known of those. Is that correct? Um, what I was hoping to describe, uh, Congressman, was that, that you know, the, the loans exist in a spectrum and at the sort of core heart and soul of the spectrum or yeah, pure could A loans. Could you pull your mic a little closer, please? I'm sorry. Thank you. Uh, we're, we're at, at the heart and soul of the spectrum would be A loans. And the, the market operates, uh, if you might imagine, in a series of concentric circles right. around that. And but, the but further I, out I, you go, the riskier I, the loans What are. I want to get to today for hopefully both an independent commission and for all of us here that are going to grapple with this for the next two years is Alt A and subprime are substantially the same. You get credit if they are in underserved areas. And in fact, since uh, my understanding of a subprime is if you have got a, a FICO score of less than 660, you are essentially subprime. And a great many of Alt A not only had a credit score of less than 660, but they didn't tell you what their income was. They just, or they told you what the income was, but they didn't prove it. Now that creates an Alt A. That it's an Alt A, but it's also a subprime. Isn't that true? Um, the, the way I would uh, I would answer the question, uh, Congressman, is that the the combination of features in the loan defines the type of loan it is. So, y yes, in the market there are Alt A subprime loans, and yes, in the market there are high FICO uh, 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 subprime loans. Any of those things is possible depending on the combination of okay. the borrower and the so this, features. So, it is relatively fair for those of us who don't do this every day to say that this is a distinction without a real difference relative to default, relative to the problem, to the extent that this, these practices are part of the problem. They are reasonably equally part of the problem because today they are equally part of the default. Is that reasonably fair? Can I get a consensus that, re remembering that none of you said you were part of the problem, but they are defaulting at substantially the same rate? Is that correct, Mr. Mudd? It, uh, I, I, I believe that it is more likely that the more variable features or, uh, or the more credit characteristics that apply to a loan, those things can aggregate to increase the risk in that loan, yes. Okay. Uh, Mr. Raines, uh, in your testimony, you have said that, that uh, Fannie Mae did not contribute significantly to the housing collapse. You acknowledge that your company, former company, holds $300 billion of Alt-A, which do not bear, verify the borrower's income. Now, if those are defaulting, and in fact be, were defaulting at a time in which unemployment was still at a historic low, then wouldn't the failure to verify income be a leading part of why you would have a default in a loan that if the person's income was in fact honestly stated, they would be able to maintain? Meaning if they didn't lie, they would make the payments and they wouldn't be in default. Isn't that true? There is a button now, on the mic. Yeah. Be sure it's on. Tr uh, trust me, I spent a lot of time making yeah. sure it was as simple as can be. If, in fact, unemployment was still at a historic low level when Alt A's began defaulting, but housing had stopped its precipitous rise, wouldn't you say, by any reasonable assessment, that, in fact, the liars of the liar loans was a significant part of it? Because those people, records are showing more and more, 
counted on a rise in value to make those loans rather than a falsely stated income? The, I think that is correct. I think that the uh, experience with Alt-A loans uh, in that period, uh, again, this is after I had left, but in the period 2006-2007 was affected by fraud. Uh, where people did not tell the truth about their assets or their income and they obtained uh, mortgages that they otherwise wouldn't have qualified for. So here today, if we take with us one take with, if you will, wouldn't it be fair to say, in retrospect, and I, and I appreciate the fact that you had mixed, mixed signals sent from Congress and others, if you had it to do it all over again, particularly Alt-A, but to a certain extent subprime, wouldn't you, if you could, have ensured that people who were looking for a home greater than, in retrospect, they could afford if it didn't go up in value, had been sent back to go find a home they could afford instead of the one they chose? Isn't that at the root of what we are here today? You know, the, de the, uh, the, the demise of, of various financial institutions mm -hmm. didn't start until the default started. We can, uh, we can appreciate that default is the beginning of this problem. So if default is the beginning of the problem and it default began, and I was with Mr. Kucinich in Cleveland well before this became descri described as a crisis, unemployment low, housing prices simply no longer going up, defaults begin to escalate. In retrospect, would each of you say, both as observers and, and, and almost current CEOs, that in fact had people been told to go back and find a home they could better afford, thus not ratcheting down people to a, a lower mortgage, that this crisis could have been reduced or averted? And I, I take a yes from everyone and walk away happy. I would like to comment on that. Yes, please. Is your mic on? Although I will take all the yeses first before the long comments. All right. Um, I think the failure to underwrite a mortgage loan properly is certainly at the core of uh, uh, what could be a uh, default on that, on that mortgage loan. So it then gets to the question as to uh, what are the underwriting requirements. Uh, so certainly uh, making a mortgage loan to someone that can't afford that mortgage loan or who might be surprised by a big sh payment shock down the road, uh, a lender or an investor in that mortgage loan has to be very cautious about that right. and, in my view, uh, should uh, do everything they can to at least educate uh, the marketplace as to what is a sound mortgage loan and what is not. With right. regard to documentation, that is a uh, as, that's a second question as to whether uh, about failure to document or to verify someone's yeah. income, which again I think a responsible lender should do. Yes, Mr. Raines, would you concur with that? Uh, I concur with uh, what uh, Mr. Brunzel just said uh, that uh, underwriting standards, uh, proper underwriting standards, could have avoided uh, many of the losses that were experienced on loans that were originated in 2005, uh, six, and seven. Okay. Would, would, would that pretty well summarize the other two, that when we are looking, we're looking back to, to make sure this doesn't happen again, generally those, those are the lessons we need to take with us for future legislation and, and messages to your former organizations. Is that right? If you could go back in retrospect, 2020 hindsight, and look at the loans that were made and pick out the ones that were delinquent or defaulted or were too, too, too close to the, to the loan-to-value ratio and redo those, would you? Yes, absolutely. Okay, thank you. I'd reserve the balance of my time. Um, and Mr. Towns, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you very much, um, Mr. Chairman. And also, let me join in saying that it's been a delight working with you. And, and of course, I'm happy to know that you're not leaving the Congress. And we'll still be able to continue to work with you probably in a different capacity, of course. So, uh, again, you provided excellent leadership and uh, you've done a lot of major things on this committee. And, of course, we, we are very grateful for that and look forward to seeing you on the other committee. Um, and also, let me thank you for holding this hearing. I think it's very, very important that we, uh, we have this hearing. Let me just begin by saying since the crisis started, and I just want to ask all of you. We have heard some people claim that poor people are to blame for this. That, that's the problem they are saying. And the way this argument goes, 
The Federal Government forced the banks to give mortgages when they shouldn't have, this is what they say, to people who were not credit worthy, then forced Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac to buy up those bad mortgages. And you are the experts here. Is that the main reason that Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac had to be taken over because they made too much financing available to low-income homeowners? Is that the problem? Let me just ruin right down the line, Mr. Byron, Mr. Siren. Sir, I think the main reason. Excuse me. Sir, I, I think the main reason for the uh, the problems with Freddie Mac and Fannie Mae. Uh, these are organizations that were not diversified and faced the, the most violent correction and the largest correction in 75 years in housing prices, which is we were in the business of insuring housing prices in effect and when that happened. Uh, I would think uh, that uh, it wasn't mostly uh, tr trying to do things for poor people. I do think that we have to realize that uh, we need a balanced housing program, and I personally am in favor of, in a, in a progressive uh, sort of way, uh, good rental housing that people can have while they're getting ready to uh, become homeowners. Thank you, sir. Right. Mr. Mudd. I would just observe, Congressman, that when the, when the market goes down, uh, it's the folks who are the closest to the margin who, uh, who get hurt first and longest every time, and that is what has produced the great uh, human tragedy of this, which is the uh, crisis of foreclosures in a lot of the towns and cities across the, uh, uh, across the country. Um, Fannie Mae's uh, business uh, was uh, to be able to provide lending all across, all across the spectrum of affordable housing. Um, and as part of that, uh, you, had, uh, you had individuals who were in those communities. And now, now and during my time, the company is doing everything it could to try to stem that wave of foreclosures and difficulties in those communities. Mr. Brinsell. As I testified, I was uh, the CEO of Freddie Mac for a long, long period of time. I cannot recall ever being forced to, to make a, or to purchase a mortgage loan uh, that I didn't feel as a matter of policy at Freddie Mac was a good mortgage loan, a sound mortgage loan, uh, and a, an attractive mortgage loan for the home buyer or the, the owner of an apartment building. Mr. Raines. Uh, I do not believe that poor people are the cause of, of the current uh, financial crisis, nor do I believe defaults on the loans that they might hold is the cause. They have too much too small a share of the market. Uh, most of the losses, as I read the record, have come on mortgages that were made to middle class and upper middle class people, not to poor people. Uh, and I do not believe that community reinvestment loans are the cause of the concern, and apparently neither does the controller of the currency uh, nor the chairman of the Fed each of whom has said that the Community Reinvestment Act requirements have no role in the uh, uh, current financial crisis. So I think, because I agree with you, that it is just simply untrue to blame the current financial crisis on low and moderate income people or on the Community Reinvestment Act or on Fannie Mae's affordable housing goals. Right. Let's face it, we do have a mess. What do we do now? What do you propose? Mr. Siring? Excuse me, sir. Uh, I think what we need to do is uh, first be cognizant, as some people have said, that, that if you want to have long-term fixed-rate mortgages, which the United States as an industrial country is pretty unique uh, in having, you need to have some mechanism like, like the GSEs. Uh, I think it is worth doing a very thorough commission or what uh, review of, of how these organizations are structured and see what we can learn from this and how we can capture the benefits of the long-term fixed-rate mortgage and uh, ameliorate some of the concerns that come out of being, for example, a uh, monoline company. Right. Mr. Mudd. Uh, sir, my, my observation would be that there are kind of three tiers of homeowners out there right now. There is a tier of folks who are continuing to make payments, continuing to stay in homes. Uh, to get ahead of the problem there, things that uh, uh, Congress or these companies or the financial industry can do to reduce the rates and reduce the monthly payment, perhaps even using the tax code, would be helpful in avoiding that segment becoming a problem. 
There's a second tier who are folks that are maybe or maybe not making their payments, struggling but staying in the homes. That group needs not only the reduction in the monthly payments, but probably some restructuring such as a balloon note or a reduction in principal. Uh, unfortunately, there is also a set of folks who are already in the process of default and foreclosure, and my recommendation there for the society is we do everything we can to keep them in, in, in those homes, uh, government relief programs, charitable relief programs, providing, uh, uh, providing a, a, a conversion from ownership back into rental, those type of things are probably going to be most successful at those levels. So I think you have to attack the problem because it is a little different depending on the type of homeowner you are addressing. Mr. Chairman, I realize my time has expired, but can I get a response from Mr. Brinzel very quickly and from Mr. Raines? Yes, your, your time has expired to ask questions, but not for the uh, uh, panel to answer them. So if, if we hear from the last two witnesses. Uh, thank you. Um, my response to answer the question would be, I think, first, uh, in agreement with uh, Mr. Mudd, uh, we need to take action to reduce the rate of uh, mortgage for or home foreclosures. And really what results ultimately from that is uh, the cascading effect on home prices and dumping of home homes on the real estate market. So I think some uh, careful review of uh, uh, foreclosure practices, loan workout practices, and so forth, mortgage modification practices uh, by all lenders and servicers and owners of these mortgage loans is extremely important. Uh, our experience at Freddie Mac in a much earlier time was it, it, it is really important to the stability of the housing market as to how one reacts to it in a time of uh, distress and uh, an increase in mortgage loan defaults. Uh, longer term going forward, I think uh, actions there need to look at uh, first uh, how to regulate better the origination practices in the country. Uh, I think there has been spotty regulation over time as to uh, the types of uh, mortgage loans that get made, how they get made, the origination practices and so forth. Part of that goes to the definition even of as to what is a subprime mortgage loan, what is covered under HOPA and what is not and, and, and all that. Um, and I do think that there are parts of this market in terms of the origination practices uh, that were uh, really very flawed. Uh, finally, as I uh, said explicitly in my testimony, I think one well, one certainly needs to uh, do, review as part of this, the work of this uh, committee and others, uh, the appropriate uh, structure of uh, Freddie Mac and Fannie Mae and the regulation of them. I, have, uh, I am absolutely convinced that uh, preserving um, a viable fixed rate mortgage market in the United States is critical uh, to this nation and that Freddie Mac and Fannie Mae as government sponsored enterprises um, with this public mission relying on sh uh, private capital is essential to it. Mr. Raines. I think there is, uh, uh, I agree with much of what has been said uh, and I think there are four steps uh, that, uh, or really five steps that need to be taken to, to resolve the overall financial crisis, but particularly with regard to housing. Uh, step number one is that we have to provide financing to the system. The system is frozen up uh, piecemeal. The uh, administration and the Fed have begun to provide financing for the good and bad, bad assets in the system. That needs to expand. Uh, second, uh, we need to, to separate the good assets from the bad assets and recapitalize financial institutions, such as Freddie Mac and Fannie Mae, but also the banks and others. They need to be recapitalized, but they need to recognize that the bad assets are bad assets and separate them so people can look at these institutions without having to guess uh, what their real financial condition is. They need to be recapitalized uh, because the bad assets, uh, you need to replace that capital. Uh, the third uh, step uh, is then to work out the bad assets. Uh, to me, I have I've been stunned at the reluctance to actually work out these millions of loans because house, houses as assets are a depreciating asset. An empty house can overnight become worthless. As people go in and strip out the copper, take out the, the plumbing, remove other things, the only thing you can do with that home is tear it down. To me, it is a crime that we are not investing funds to keep people in these homes. Uh, it is too late to worry about moral hazard with regard to these loans. 
The last two things relate to regulation. We need to have more extensive regulation of big leveraged financial entities, whether they are called GSEs or called banks or called insurance companies or hedge funds, whatever their name. If they are big enough to threaten the economy, there has to be intelligent regulation. And the last point uh, is there needs to be regulation to, to protect consumers. There is no way that the average consumer can understand the documents that are placed in front of them uh, when they get a mortgage. I know I can't, and I have tried. I made it through one time and I got to all but one that I could understand. That one, I, to this day, I don't know what it said. Uh, and every day we are asking ordinary consumers to understand negative amortization, uh, to understand what it means for them to have a subprime versus a prime loan, to understand a 230 mortgage. It is impossible for the average person to keep up with this. We need to have more rigorous protection of consumers in the mortgage market. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for the courtesy that you extended. Thank you, Mr. Towns. I would like to request the members, if you have an open-ended question, ask it in the beginning rather than the end of the uh, five minutes. Uh, Mr. Mike. Thank you, um, Mr. Chairman. Um, uh, we have got before us uh, some of the perpetrators of the uh, uh, financial meltdown of our country. Uh, it is interesting how the committees operated. Uh, if you want to see where we are going today, read today's uh, Washington Post. Commend the staff working diligently with the Washington Post to see where they are trying to lead the public. Uh, committee led the public, uh, tried to lead the public first that it is uh, Wall Street's fault. And today we are going to concentrate on 2005 forward uh, or four forward. Uh, but uh, you have also heard some of the perpetrators uh, most recently and named here of the, our financial downfall uh, blame it on somebody else. And Mr. Raines, uh, of course, he, he had, you know, his hands are clean and he is uh, telling us how to, how to behave in the future. Uh, just for the record, uh, let me just read from Investor Daily a different take on this. Uh, Fannie and and Freddie, the main vehicle of Clinton's multicultural housing policy, drove the explosion of the subprime housing market by buying up literally hundreds of billions of dollars in substandard lo loans, funding loans that ordinarily wouldn't have been made based on much time-honored notions as putting money down, having sufficient income, and maintaining a payment record indicating cred credit worthiness. With all the old rules out the window, Franny, F Fanny and Freddie gobbled up the market using extraordinary leverage. Uh, uh, they eventually controlled 90 percent of the secondary market mortgages. Their total portfolios, top, top $5.4 trillion, half of all U.S. mortgage lending. And they, uh, they told you that they were following uh, Wall Street. Mr. Uh, Raines uh, mentioned just uh, in his little uh, commentary to us that we had to have good underwriting standards. Actually, if we go back and we look at some of the underwriting standards, they started to deteriorate, in fact, under the Clinton administration. But we don't want to talk about that today. Mr. Raines, you were there when uh, Mr. Como decided to lower the reserves from 10 uh, percent to 2.5 billion. That was a little bit of lowering some of the standards. Uh, and then you came and testified uh, uh, before Congress uh, that the reserves that were adequate before you left. Um, Mr. Raines uh, went on to uh, say in 1999, uh, let me read this uh, quote from uh, September 30th, 1999. Fannie Mae has expanded home ownership for millions of families by the 90s by reducing down payment requirements. I guess that wouldn't be lowering standards, said Franklin Raines, Fannie Mae's chairman and chief executive officer. Then continue the quote, yet there remain too many borrowers whose credit is just a notch below what our underwriting has required who have been uh, relegated to paying significantly higher mortgage rates. Uh, than the so-called subprime uh, market. Mr. Raines uh, 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 was indeed part of the, the problem. Mr. Raines uh, 
uh, was also found uh, that his, under his watch, the Office of Federal Housing Enterprise Oversight, regulating the body of Fannie Mae, uh, found that uh, Mr. Raines, uh, uh, and under his directorship, uh, he received $50 million uh, uh, in overstated or uh, and he overstated earnings by f some $50 million estimated uh, to gain huge bonuses. Mr. Raines, I have uh, some of your compensation here. Uh, could you tell the committee how much compensation that you received uh, uh, from 1998 uh, through the time you left? Bonuses, compensation, benefits. Would you say it's 90 million, 100 Please, million? Please uh, put on your mic. Sorry. Uh, Ofeo has estimated the number is 90 million dollars. Okay. And when you were found uh, uh, that under your your leadership that uh, some of these factors had been fudged. Uh, well, first of all, uh, the two fellows over here, Mr. Siren, you're tr you just left in September. Uh, and Well, let's go back to Reigns. Reigns, um, we said to 2004, you're still getting bonuses. In 2008, so far, you've gotten $2,085,000. Uh, uh, That's just a year to date, uh, payments from Fannie Mae. Is that correct? Uh, That's what I'm given. The uh, number I think you're referring to is the result of the settlement I had with Ofeo. Yeah, it was a neat settlement too because uh, uh, you agreed to donate some of your stock uh, rather than take uh, uh, the proceeds from the stock. Was is that was that part of the settlement? That was part of the settlement, and that's what's represented that in clever. that number that you have in front of you. That was pretty clever because you had about a million and a half in stocks. But I'll bet you if we get your tax returns, you donated that and then took uh, a, an, an exemption for that. Is that correct? Gentlemen's time has expired, but you Oh, you didn't the file question. tax returns for? For 2008, uh, no. No, no, I'm not talking about 2008. I'm talking about your settlement with, uh, I need an additional minute. Uh, can I have Well, I, I, Mr. Issa has time. I'll, I'll, I'll give the gentleman my last yeah. minute. Okay, gentlemen's. Yeah. So again, uh, uh, I, I know what you did. Uh, the settlement, you, you, you really didn't pay anything. You probably took a tax deduction uh, to deduct the, uh, the amount that you said you were donating. And then the insurance company actually paid the fine. Uh, Fannie Mae's uh, insurance paid the fine that uh, was levied on you. Is that correct? There was $3 million no fi dollar fine? There was no fine there levied on you. There was $3 million dollars that, that, that was paid by the insurance. We can call it whatever we, we take. <laughs> Uh, what, what you like. The last thing, uh, I don't have a lot of time here, is this is a bill Mr. Shays. Mr. Shays introduced in 92 uh, to further regulate some of the practices that were going on at Fannie Mae. Uh, 107, and, and I know you helped to kill this. I was one of Mr. Shays co-sponsors. $175 million was spent in lobbying from 1998. Uh, a good portion of that under Mr. Rain's reign. Is that correct? I am not familiar with that number, no, sir. You aren't. But you are familiar with the lobbying operation that you had from 98 to when you left in 2004. Fannie Mae didn't have lobbyists during that period, yeah. yes, sir. And, and, and you are going to tell me that if I find some documents that showed you tried to influence killing the uh, legislation that would have regulated Fannie Mae, uh, that that, that uh, documentation doesn't exist? The gentleman's time has expired. Oh, I you, want him to answer that last uh, question. There's a, there's a pending question, and the gentleman will be a given opportunity to answer it. I have no idea what documentation you have. Fannie Mae, like any other corporation uh, owned by shareholders, came to Congress and expressed its views. And we have done that consistently uh, in another committee uh, where I have had the opportunity to testify many times. And that is a matter of public record. Gentlemen's time has expired. Mr. Kinjorski. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, maybe I should make an observation that I thought the purpose of this hearing would be to uncover the potential causes of the real estate disaster in the country, but it seems we are going over testimony that I have heard in another life before the Financial Services Committee. 
And I suggest if the members of this committee want to get a good history, go back and read the volumes and volumes of testimony from 2000 on until uh, 2005 when uh, while the uh, Financial Services Committee and the Congress of the United States was under the control of the Republican majority and uh, the piece of legislation that Mr. Micah refers to was introduced by a Republican while he was in the majority of the Congress and under a Republican president, it failed to move through. But I'm not going to make those points about getting into politics because really it's, uh, it's really unimportant. The question is, and I think Mr. Towns put his hand on it, are there any observations that you can make to help us out as to how we can stop? And I think my first question would be, as I understand it, uh, Fannie and Freddie would be in trouble today even if they had not been involved in subprime uh, lending of purposes. Is that correct? Assuming that you never had packaged a subprime a situation and the real estate devaluation in this country fell by approximately 30 percent as it has. Under the formulas that we had studied in the Financial Services Committee for five years, it was indicated to be the perfect worst storm. I think, Mr. Range, you recall when Mr. Baker was holding those hearings and we were all saying what would happen if we had a perfect, terrible storm. And, and if I recall, I think the, the testimony of yourself was that if the real estate uh, deflation in this country amounted to more than 25 percent, all real estate and all of the GSEs would be in trouble. And lo and behold, that's exactly what has happened. So I repose the mm -hmm. question. If there had never been subprime mortgages in the portfolio of Fannie and Freddie, would it still have difficulty because of the precipitous fall of valuation of the real estate market of this country, particularly where you're so heavily involved in California, Florida, Nevada, and states that have really suffered that uh, devaluation? Can the gentleman, answer that. I, I, as an analogy, if you're in the business of insuring against hurricanes and hurricanes hit a third of the country, um, you're going to you're going to suffer. Uh, if you are in the business, solely the business of financing U.S. housing and the U.S. housing market goes down by 30 percent, you are going to suffer. Yes, sir. We all knew that, didn't we? That was brought out in testimony four or five years ago. Is that correct? Th that it was modeled and discussed and yes. disclosed, Mr. yes. Mr. Raines? I completely agree with your characterization uh, that uh, it was well known that a, a significant decline in housing prices would have a dramatic effect not just on the GSEs but on the entire financial uh, system. The housing market is so big, uh, the housing finance market is so big that you cannot have a major impact there without affecting the entire economy. So I think your characterization is exactly right. Okay. We are thrusting around right now to find some underpinning to real estate valuation, stop the deflation in the real estate market, and to sustain people in houses, as you have all discussed, to prevent foreclosure but uh, hold the market and hold the house occupied so that it doesn't depreciate in value. Have either of you gentlemen participated in an analysis to see whether or not we could create a subsidiary corporation, a, a, a sponsored enterprise of the Federal Government to aid or subsidize uh, mortgages that are going underwater or going into foreclosure? to hold people in their homes and what the relevant, relevant cost would be of doing that mm -hmm. uh, and would the, the value of rescue to the economy warrant taking that unusual action in, in, the, hun in the million or million and a half mortgages that probably mm -hmm. could be uh, held residents in, uh, in residence or foreclo uh, foreclosure tenants in residence? Mm -hmm. Well, Mr. Kanjorsk, I have done a little analysis of that, but without uh, the benefit of a lot of staff resources. But it is my view, and I think it is the view of a number of, uh, of consumer-oriented groups, that amounts as small as ten dollars to $20,000 can go a long way to salvaging a lot of mortgages. In many cases, lenders and the homeowners are not that far apart in their ability to modify a loan and make it work going forward. And so, in my view, providing that kind of money at the table uh, where there are negotiations going on to modify mortgages would have a substantial impact 
And you can do that without having to go and buy up all the mortgages in the country. You can simply provide that additional funds to bridge the gap on a modification. I believe that would have a significant uh, positive uh, net present value for the taxpayer as well as for the homeowner and the lender. How would we get that analysis done quickly and by whom? Well, I think the, uh, uh, the best resources that are available to the Congress uh, on uh, understanding the housing market exist within Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. And I believe that through their contacts with the, their servicers, uh, they can give you a pretty quick assessment of what level of uh, funding would need to be uh, available to greatly increase the, uh, the rate of working out mortgages. Could we take that action even though uh, the, the real estate market has not cease to deflate? In other words, could we do it at any point and plug in, or do we have to wait until we hit the bottom of the real estate market to start working the rescue? I think you can, I think you can uh, start now uh, and work with those loans that are uh, available to be uh, modified. Certainly there are some we will find that the market has gone down further, uh, but trying to wait until the market hits bottom, I think, will only make the bottom deeper. And uh, therefore, I think starting now uh, and ramping up over time is the right way to do it. You, you, can't, you can't charm the market back into having confidence, but if you start working out loans one by one, people will begin to have confidence. Thank you, Mr. Kanjorski. Your time has expired. Chairman. Mr. Burton. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Raines, uh, have you ever heard the term friend of Angelo program? I have heard of that term in the newspapers. Uh, have you ever had a home loan from Countrywide? Yes. Uh, was this home loan given to you through a term, uh, uh, through the term friend of Angelo? No. So you didn't get any preferential treatment? No, I did not. I did not get any preferential treatment in terms of the terms of my mortgage. So you, you, had the, you paid the same rate and the same conditions as anybody else would under the same conditions? We had the same credit profile, the same loan to value uh, as I had. Yes, so sir. So if we checked on that loan that you got from Countrywide, uh, we wouldn't find anything different than any other person who borrowed from Countrywide in the whole country. I mean, you'd get the same. You would not get preferential treatment. I, I am unaware of any preferential treatment uh, that uh, given to me by Countrywide. Would it be possible to get copies of uh, the mortgage papers uh, that you had uh, made with Countrywide? I am sure that Countrywide has copies of them. Do you have copies? I don't know, but I could look. I, that, that, I no longer uh, own that property. That loan no longer well, yeah, is on I'm the sure books. Well, I am sure you kept those documents. I keep mine for a long, long time. I mean, if you had a mortgage on a home. Could you, could you provide those to, to the committee for the record? I will look for them, and, and if I can find them, I will be happy to. Thank you very much. Uh, did you or anyone at your direction discuss with Angelo Mosello, I guess that is how you pronounce his name, or his subordinates, any government or elected officials who might be candidates for this kind of preferential program? Did you ever talk to him about the, the, this uh, special treatment for any government officials? No. Never did? Never. You are sure? Yes. None of the states, none of the U.S. Senators or Congressmen or anybody in the government that you know of, you never discussed their loans with Mr. Mazzello? No. I, didn't, I never did that. Okay. Mr. Reins and Mr. Mudd, uh, we have a September 2004 memo that discusses a 16-month outlook for Fannie Mae from uh, Mr. Marzal, uh, Chief Credit Officer and later Executive Vice President for Finance and Credit. The memo was written to Mr. Mudd and was developed at Frank's request. I presume that was you, Mr. Reins. And uh, Mr. Marzal writes that the trend of rising home prices nationally will continue in the near term, but the downside risks will be greater due to declining affordability and signs of frothiness in some areas. This sounds like a clear warning as early as 2004 from him that a housing bubble was likely to occur. Yet it was precisely in 2004 when Fannie Mae started increasing its purchases of risky subprime and all day mortgages dramatically. And I can't understand why would anyone enter into a risky market like the subprime business when he knew there was a possible bust in the housing bubble. Can you explain that to me? I mean, uh, he, he sent this memo to you, and yet you increased 
the risky mortgages and, su and uh, 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 subprime Alt-A mortgages that you were, you were uh, uh, supporting? If you are talking about 2004 when I was there, I can, I can respond to that. Uh, which is, in fact, Mr. during Mudd, Mr. Mudd can respond uh, subsequent to right. that. In 2004, Fannie Mae, in fact, lost uh, a dramatic share of the market because it did not participate in these markets. And where we did buy uh, subprime loans, uh, we also sought to get insurance from the, uh, covering those loans from mortgage insurance companies, where they would absorb the risk of, of the mortgages. So we were very cautious about any entry into that market uh, and uh, and how we did it. And I think it has been proven by the performance of those loans. They perform better than the uh, loans in the market well, as a whole. Uh, according to Mr. Marzel, that, uh, in 2004, he said that there was a real problem, that a housing bubble was likely to occur and it would be a bust. And according to the information we have, uh, Fannie Mae increased its purchases of risky subprime and all day mortgages dramatically after that. Mr. Mudd, you were in charge after that. Do you want to respond? Yeah. The, uh, uh from uh, 2004 to 2005, uh, the purchases of subprime securities actually went down from $34.5 billion to $16.3 billion and then went up again in 2006, largely a reflection of what was being so, Pardon me for interrupting, but at that point, was there a redefinition of subprime through your underwriting mechanisms there? I mean, your underwriting standards went down. And so if your underwriting standards went down, then a risky risk, uh, uh, a mortgage that consi was considered a, a risk uh, would no longer be considered a risk because you lowered your underwriting standards. Did that take place during that time frame? Um, did, you, did you change your underwriting standards at that time? The underwriting standards change constantly in a financial services company in response to the market. During, the, during the time when you were in charge, did the underwriting change dramatically so that the subprime risk went up? Uh, we, we did our best at the time to balance out both sides of the equation with respect to risk, which the, the financial institution takes risk the day you open. You, you were the so, ultimate person who made the decision on elder, uh, underwriting changes, were you not? No. As the chief executive officer? I'm chief executive officer, so I'm, I'm responsible, yes. Am I making principal decisions about, uh, about product? Were you when there was a change like that, when they changed the underwriting requirements? Uh, I think it is important, Congressman, to understand there are two sides to the underwriting equ equation. One is the risk side and the other is the pricing side. So one has to look both at what is the incremental risk you are taking and, secondly, are you pricing for it and you, are you getting appropriately compensated for that risk. Based on everything that we knew at the time, we did the best that we could to ensure that we were pricing for the risk that we were putting on the book because the market had moved in a direction because of the affordability problem Mr. Marzol referred to. Mr. Gentleman's Chairman, time I, I, Mr. has McKin expired. Mr. Kajorski had a little extra time. Can I make one brief comment, Mr. Chairman? Well, your time has expired. Well, how about it, it, Mr. Kajorski? He had extra time. I no, he didn't. Lot. He didn't have well, extra time. I saw time. the light. I'm sorry. Uh, you, you forgot what it's like to be at the end of the line waiting for your turn, but that's why we're going to try to stick to well, the five minutes. Um, now I want to recognize Ms. Maloney, but before I do, I would like to ask unanimous consent that the documents from Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac uh, productions identified by the majority and minority as relevant to today's hearing will be included in the record. Without objection, that will be the order. Ms. Maloney, you are recognized for five minutes. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chairman. You have been a spectacular chairman. It has been an honor to serve on this committee. And in your new position on the Commerce Committee, you will be trying, confronting really some of the most pressing issues we have, universal health care, health care for the 9-11 workers, global war warming, energy independence. And my constituents wish you well, particularly those without health care. And I hope this committee can play a supportive role in the many challenges you confront. Um, my, my constituents are very angry about these bailouts, and they want to know why a $100 billion line of credit was given to Freddie and, and Fannie, and that Freddie has drawn down $15 billion of that $100 billion line of credit. Uh, we were looking at what happened. They want to understand what happened. So in preparing, we interviewed uh, your former Chief Risk Officer, Mr. David Andraconis, from 2003 to 2005. He said he held that position and reported directly to you. He told us that during these years, mortgage lenders were making increasing uh, demands 
for Alt-A loans, loans that had no documentation. He found them risky. I know that in New York many people said it was easier to get a loan with no documentation than to pay your rent during these days. And he said, and I quote, Wall Street became, I think, pretty adept at packaging securities of loans that we would have considered to be higher risk, that is, reduced or very little documentation, end quote. According to him, big mortgage lenders like Countrywide and Lehman put a lot of pressure on Freddie Mac uh, to buy these risky no-doc Alt-A loans. And he said these lenders were constantly looking to reduce documentation because it was easier to produce the loans, then sell them, get fees, and uh, the toxic loans are now what we're confronting. He said that uh, he reached out to you. He said that he was opposed to these no documentation loans, that he talked to you directly, that he sent you memo after memo outline, outlining to you and the board and others that this was risky and, and, and not the right way to go. And I'd like to put these memos in the, in the record along with the interview that was conducted with him and our staff. And so I'd Without like to objection, ask, no uh, Mr. Siren, is it true that your chief risk officer advised you not to buy these reduced documentation Alt-A no-doc loans? Well, first of all, uh, I, I don't believe I've seen those memos, uh, memos that were addressed to me, but I'm not sure. But it, we'll, it, we'll, it, we'll it, be it, glad to give them to you. Okay. You mean he never, he never told you? Did he no, advise no. you to buy those loans? No, no, and then no. Then he's perjured himself. Did he tell you to buy the Alt-8 loans? No, ma'am. He did not. Did he advise you that they might be risky? Yes, ma'am, but if he you did? look... Well, let me say that furthermore, I only have four minutes. Furthermore, I'd like to say that he was right because under your leadership, Freddie Mac bought more than $150 billion of no-doc Alt-A loans, and according to your most recent SEC report, your company's Alt-A purchases have resulted in more than $8 billion this year in credit losses alone due to these risky products that your chief risk officer said do not buy. Now, what happened to Mr. David Adrakanis? He was fired. He was fired. He felt that you agreed with him, but that you still continued to buy what everyone was saying was high risk. It's common sense. If you give a loan to someone and they don't even have to show you that they have a job, you're in trouble. So my question to you now, and my basic question to you, in light of all of the money that Freddie has lost, and the taxpayer money that has supporting you, and you've spent $15 billion of it, given the fact that you lost so much money on these Alt-A risky documents, wouldn't it have been better not to fire your risk manager, but to fire your portfolio manager of your Alt-A loans? Do you regret firing a risk manager who told you that you were moving in the wrong direction, that it was risky and toxic and uh, not what you should be doing, do you regret firing him? Do you regret buying these risky loans? Do you regret the way you led and I would say mismanaged your company? Well, well uh, ma'am, if you go back uh, and look at uh the records in uh, Freddie Mac, and I think you said 2000, but it's 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 about Two, right. 2003 to 2005. Yeah, that's right. There was uh, I'm not sure the exact time, but there there was a long, long debate with people on uh, both sides of what should be done uh, with Alt A. Uh, it uh, this this was done in the 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 debate was uh, in the context of uh, an environment in which. Uh, Freddie Mac's market share was declining, and the question of our relevance and ability to influence markets. But, sir, with all due respect. Uh, excuse me, Ms. Maloney, your question is pending, and the gentleman okay. should answer it, and then we have to move on. Okay. The time has expired. It, it, I'm so, the it, question is do you regret the decision to fire the risk manager and it, not to fire the portfolio manager? And, the, the, and to buy the Alt A loans that were risky yeah. and that's, put that's the question, taxpayers' and then money we're at move risk. On. Okay. Uh, first, first of all, Mr. Andriconis uh, uh, was fired for uh, a variety of reasons, and it wasn't not primarily for 
uh, his having a view on 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 uh, uh, credit. Uh, second, uh, I'm trying to remember the different parts of the question. Uh, second, uh, in in perfect hindsight, right? Uh, you know, we uh, I think uh, always wish that any loan that went bad that, that we hadn't bought. But given the information that we had at the time, and given the balance that we were trying to achieve, uh, we thought we made the right decision at the time. Gentlelady's right time has expired. Gentlelady's time has expired now, Mr. Westmoreland. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I'm going to ask each one of you this question so you can be thinking about it. And I'll start with Mr. Siren. Mr. Siren, what, what was your salary from 2003 to 2008, your total salary? And do you get any pension? Uh, my, total, my total salary over that period of time was about $4 million a year. Uh, and uh, I have pension rights that I'm, I'm not quite sure, but I think after tax, uh, worth in the neighborhood of a little less than two million dollars. About how much? I think a little less than two million, though I'm not sure the two exact. Two million a year? At no, 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 no. No, the the present value actuarially, depending on how long I live. Hmm. Uh, Mr. Mudd, same question to you. From uh, 2005 to 2008, your total compensation? Uh, I have a different number, so if I can uh, make an estimate. To meet your request, it would be in the vicinity of probably seven or eight million dollars of compensation. That wouldn't be counting any stock, which had a, obviously grant value and, and very little value now. But total, you're going to stay with seven or eight million because the stock. I, I have the, no the numbers. I have numbers for 04 to 08. Okay. But I'd be happy to supply you those. You get a later pension. And, Are you eligible for a pension? Writing, if that would be helpful. Are you eligible for a pension? Uh, I believe so. Yes. And what would that pension be? I can't be precise. I'd have to res research it, but I'd be happy to get back to you and on that okay. number. And and so, did this pension come from just your three years of service, or had you been? Um, no, I I had been with the company going back to 2000, so I would assume that it would have accrued throughout that that period. Okay, so you've been with the company eight years, and you're going to get a pension of somewhere. Um, if I could get you a precise number, research it. I, okay. I, All right. I, I don't want to. All right, Mr. Brenzel. I don't know. How about you? Now. Yes. Uh, of course, I left the company in. Uh, right. Yeah. June of 2000. Is your is your mic on? Oh, I'm sorry. So, uh, what what years are you? Uh, from '87 to 2003. Oh my, uh, that is a matter of uh, public, uh, uh, certainly public disclosure. Uh, uh, Can you give me a hint? Well, um, I would have to say the. Uh, in the last few years, the uh, the amount disclosed uh, reflecting stock grants and everything uh, based on the valuations uh, used uh, was it, uh, about ten million dollars a year. Uh, of that, uh, about ten million a year. Uh, yes, including yeah. the stock grants. Yeah, uh, uh, I got the you. Uh, salary. The salary uh, was about a million dollars in two thousand and two and two thousand and three. They got you cheap. Pardon me? They got you cheap. Um, <laughs> how about your pension? I, I am eligible for a, a pension, and I am receiving a pension. And how much is that? That it, it is reflecting my 21 years of service. Uh, it is about $400,000 a year. Okay. Now, Mr. Raines, I know that uh, it's been said, you know, that $90 million, and I noticed in your testimony you got some explanation of that, that it really wasn't $90 million, But what was your total package for the time that you were there? Well, you, you, you I don't had know your off the top of my head. The number I referred to was a number that Ofeo has included in their documents. Okay. Well, you you'd had 90 million in there, and then you said there was uh, uh, some discrepancy in that, and because it's not a discrepancy. Stock. The uh, accepting the Ofeo number as the beginning point, 40% uh, of that has effectively been clawed back as a result of my settlement with Ofeo and the uh, and the stock options that I was awarded. Uh, becoming worthless. So 40 percent of the 90, if you accept the 90 as the number, uh, has been clawed back by one means or another. That's still good money, though. You know, that's still good money. Excellent money. And, and what kind of pension do you get, sir? I uh, qualify for a pension based on my 11 years at Fannie Mae. And, and what would that be? It's a 
I know you got three million one year, four hundred thousand one year. Not uh, as a pen no. My pension is about approximately one point two million dollars. One point two million dollars uh, for the eleven years of service. That's that's not good. I mean that is good. That's good money. Um, and let me let me say this. You know, I, I'm glad that I came to the hearing today to learn that none of y'all had anything to do with the Fannie Mae or Freddie Mac going south. That y'all were getting paid million dollars a year millions of dollars a year, but you didn't know anything was wrong. You didn't have any idea that it was going south, and none of you seem to have done anything about it. I hadn't heard one person say today that you recognized that Fannie Mae or Freddie Mac was in trouble and that you did something about it. So it's quite extraordinary, and I think the American people and the taxpayers are going to be kind of miffed that uh, y'all's job was basically uh, as CEOs of these companies was rearranging the deck furniture on the Titanic as it went down and didn't know it was going down. That Gentleman's is time amazing. has expired. If the witness is, it's, I don't know if it's a pending question or not, but let's. Uh, if Mr. Mr. Chair Mr. Yes. Chairman, I, I, I want to respond uh, to that last uh, comment. When I left Freddie Mac in uh, June of 2003, uh, Freddie Mac uh, was uh, safe and sound and well capitalized and uh, had a high quality uh, mortgage portfolio. Thank you. Now we uh, go to uh, Mr. Cummings. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and um, gentlemen, thank you for being here. I, just, I can tell you as I sit here, I, you know, I, I'm just disturbed, uh, and that's putting you lightly, um, because when I look at this fiasco, um, I think both of these companies did have something to do with it, and I'm not going to sit here and act like you didn't. And I think Tom Friedman, in his article dated November 25th, the New York Times put it right. He said, so many people were in on it, people who had no business buying a home with nothing down and nothing to pay for two years. People who had no business pushing such mortgages but made fortunes doing so. People who had no business bundling those loans into securities and selling them to third parties as if they were AAA bonds but made fortunes doing so. People who had no business rating those loans as AAA but made fortunes doing so. And people who had no business buying those bonds and putting them on their balance sheet so they could earn a little better yield, but had no, but made fortunes doing so. And you know, the thing that gets me is that I've got uh, constituents who, and I think Mr. Towns alluded to this, folks have tried to blame poor people and minorities, but a lot of those people, and I, and I admire you for what you said, Mr. Brinzel, you talked about the dreams of folk and trying to help them get a, get a home and how important it is. But what has happened as a result of all of these folks, including some of you guys, what has happened is that the people in my district have been left with two things, holding a bag. They've lost their houses and they've got zero in one bag and debt in the other. That's what they've got. And so I want to go to you, Mr. Siren, because you, you said some very interesting things that I'd like to just hear a little bit more about. You know, you talked about these, these no asset, no income, no asset loans. They're called NINA loans, is that right? Yes, sir. Keep your voice up. We want to hear clearly what you're saying. Yes, sir. Banks use a no income, no asset mortgage to lend money to a borrower without requiring any information about the person's income or assets. This was an increasingly popular type of Alt-A loan in 2004, 2005, 2006, and Freddie Mac purchased a lot of them. Let me ask a, a common sense question. Why would anyone give a mortgage without requiring information on a borrower's income or assets? Help me with that. Well, sir, if you have information on their FICO score, right, and they have a strong FICO score, and you have information on the loan-to-value ratio of the property, uh, in uh, many of those cases you would see that, uh, that uh, the risk for the loan shouldn't be that great. The, these loans were developed in the first place for what might, you might call uh, borrowers that had, had, had special characteristics, uh, i.e., uneven income flows, actors, uh, waitresses. Well, obviously you're not familiar with Mr. Raines' testimony because what I read in his written testimony, he said part of the problem was 
when we got into these subprimes, before they were based on people had equity, and then when they didn't, and, and when we moved to these kinds of loans, they were more based on scores. So we got rid of the equity, a lot of times the equity that, that we really needed to secure these loans, I mean, to truly secure them, and we went to this other form of basically what you're about to tell me now. But so did you, can you tell me why Mike May, one of your top executives, wrote in a memo to you on October 6, 2004, that Freddie should continue buying Nina loans because, in his words, quote, it provides unique market growth opportunities to Freddie Mac? Sir, I don't have the memo uh, before me, but I'll, I'll try to answer on the basis of Briefly, because they don't give me five minutes. Okay. Uh, I think what, what had happened is the market had migrated away from the traditional kinds of products that Freddie Mac and Fannie Mae uh, had provided. And I think what he was, I, I'm, I, I'm speculating. Well, let me speculate. I, let me tell you what I speculate. I speculate it was about profit. I speculate that it was about greed because a top Freddie uh, credit official, Ray Romano, explained the rationale for doing so on June 4, 2007, in a memo to the Freddie Mac board, where he warned about the, quote, the increased reputation, fraud, predatory lending, and credit risk posed by our current program. How about that? Well, so As you speculate. We're an organization that had to develop balance, uh, and we had to balance between the needs of, of safety and soundness, the needs of our mission, and the needs also to be relevant from the perspective of uh, our shareholders because we were like any other privately held company. And I checked a number of times and we had no ability to, to treat our shareholders differently than anyone else did. I see my time is up. Thank you, Mr. Cummings. Uh, Mr. Souter. Thank you. I want to follow up just a little bit on a similar line that my friend Mr. Cummings uh, just had. I mean, one of the extraordinary things about this series of hearings, whether it was the bond people or the AIG people or the hedge fund people, nobody takes responsibility for anything. Nobody comes up and, and says, I'm sorry, I may have made some judgments, I did the best I could. It's like, no, it wasn't us. Uh, and, and it gets very frustrating to figure out what to do next if nobody's responsible for anything. They, um, uh, I uh, was really intrigued with the statement of, with 2020 hindsight, it would be reasonable to say that people who didn't have credible income uh, to meet their payments, who were depending on house values going up to meet it, or who lied, would have been higher in defaulting. You know, yeah, I'd say with 2020 hindsight, in fact, I would say the average American can figure that out with foresight. And they don't need to be paid $7 million a year to figure that out with foresight. That, that your, your model that was not working. Now, what's disturbing to me is, is that you said, Mr. Mudd, that you weren't sure whether it was systemic or cyclical. So that you plunged into it, uh, you know, separating now subprime and the, uh, the uh, Alt-A types of things. But then, in addition to that, uh, I think Mr. Siron said in his testimony, uh, and Mr. Mudd, you said similar, that uh, your organizations were there to make the market work in order to provide, as somebody who supported uh, affordable housing and who found Mr. Rain's statement really interesting, because this isn't just about low-income housing. This is about what happened to the housing market as a whole. And if what you said, can I, can I ask you a follow-up question on that? You said it wasn't just low income, it was higher. Are you saying that for Fannie and Freddie, your problems aren't just low income, that Fannie and Freddie was also going far beyond affordable housing and giving risky loans? What I was saying is that Fannie Mae provides service to low, moderate, and middle income Americans. And I was saying in answer to the question that low income Americans have not contributed disproportionately to the problems that Fannie Mae or Freddie Mac. In other words, it, and, uh, uh, reclaiming my time, I just want to make that clear that it wasn't just the lowest housing uh, portion here, that Fannie and Freddie were risking dollars as they moved up the scale because, in fact, there appears to have been as much of a profit motive as there was just to get people into homes. And that's important as we develop the, the uh, where we go next. And the challenge here is, is that since I understand Mr. Siron's uh, uh, testimony, he says, uh, let me make sure, yes, that you do this 
enabling banks to make new loans. In other words, part of the purpose of these agencies was to expand and enable. So when you went into this market, you pretended like you came in late, reluctantly, you were worried whether your business model, whether it was systemic or, or cyclical, but in fact, you're the enablers agency. That you, in, in fact, your two agencies enabled this market, it gave it a security that it didn't otherwise have, or it might have flattened out, in fact. If we could put this uh, up, Mr. Siren, a March 30, 2004 email from one of your executives. The author describes loosening of Freddie Mac's underwriting standards in order to accommodate risky mortgages that do not require verifying the borrower's income or assets, which is extraordinary. He goes on to write, these are largely driven by a need to allow lenders to compete with Countrywide's Fast and Easy program and Bank of America's Paper Saver programs. I view these programs as fundamentally changing the underwriting process for as much as 30 plus percent of the mortgage loans we purchase. Now, the question here is, is what were Fannie and Freddie trying to compete with Countrywide's Fast and Easy programs for? I mean, what you're supposed to be the more, uh, you're supposed to not be the enabler of risky programs. Where was your check? Mr. Siren, do you S want to S S much? Sir, uh, uh, I would uh, debate whether we were, uh, that this market wouldn't have developed uh, even if we weren't involved in it. I mean, what we saw in the subprime market is the okay, subprime yeah, market developed around that, and let, let me, so did the all day market. Let me ask a follow up to that. Do you believe that if Fannie and Freddie would not have gotten involved in this market, that the market would have flattened? In other uh, words, I'm not saying it wouldn't have started, but would it have flattened, or in fact, did your involvement accelerate the market, give a, a glint of federal, because people don't know whether you're private, public, or whatever, approval to that market in a different way, and in fact, the taxpayers have wound up now holding your share, and in fact, then wound up with a bigger problem than we would have had. Sir, I, I, in, in all due respect, I think you'd be speculating on my part whether the market would have flattened or not because other markets that we were not in expanded and expanded quite rapidly. So you, you don't believe you had any basic responsibility for the crisis? That's your testimony? That you, you believe it was okay you went and competed with Countrywide and put uh, Fannie and Freddie at, at, at risk and, and gave a patina of cover for this? For profit motive? Sir, and, and uh, I can honestly say, I'm not saying we made decisions perfectly. We certainly didn't, as you pointed out. But I can honestly say that in what we were trying to do at the time, we were trying to balance the interests of our mission, our regulatory objectives, and our obligation to, sh to shareholders. By, by taking in 2020. I'm sorry, the gentleman's time has expired. that did not. Thank you very much. The gentleman from Ohio, Mr. Kucinich. Uh, I, I thank the gentleman. Uh, you know, I'm listening to my colleague, Mr. Westmoreland, and I want to pick up on something that he said. You know, we, we've got some of the uh, representatives here who act like you just didn't know. That it's almost like hearing a response that, uh, I don't know nothing. No responsibility, no accountability. Stuff just happens. It's a housing market. It's the economy. It's the poor people wanting homes. But the facts show, gentlemen, that um, many of you at this table did know the risks and that you were warned not to take them and that you ignored your internal advisor, your chief risk officer. Now, Mr. Mudd, um, we, the committee has been provided with an email that your chief risk officer sent to your CEO and copied you. You are dealing with hundreds of billions of dollars, and this memo from your chief risk officer says, the company has one of the weakest control processes I have ever witnessed in my career. He says the company really doesn't get it. It is scraping on controls. Now, it appears from the record that as CEO, you were taking hundreds of billions of, of more risk. You are warned by your chief credit officer not to do that. You are taking higher risks anyway, and then you cut the budget of your chief risk officer by 16 percent. You took on more risk while cutting internal uh, controls. 
and at the same time you're telling your board you had all the resource necessary to properly assess risk. Now you received an email from your chief credit o risk officer, uh, Enrico Delavecchia, that said, I'm very upset I had to stand at a board meeting and here we have the will and money to support taking more credit risk. Now Mr. Mudd, you testified that uh, your investment strategy is to keep up with the market. Did you change, uh, did you have a change in strategy that involved reducing the resources of your credit risk office which assess the inherent dangers of your investment strategy while at the same time you are taking more external risks? Was that part of your strategy to reduce that credit risk office? No. Then why, then why was there a, a budget cut occurring uh, while you are involved in these uh, great risks with uh, billions of dollars? Uh, Congressman, I think the best response is to read my uh, The best response is the truth. Now, did someone tell you to cut credit risk? to cut the credit risk office budget or did you make that decision? Uh, um, let me read you what I wrote back to him. Can you answer the question? Who told you to cut the budget? Who told you to cut it? You are dealing with hundreds of billions of dollars. Can you answer the question? Who made the decision to cut the credit risk office's resources at the time that you are taking increased risk? The cuts in the budget that applied across the company were driven by the financial need to drive higher capital in the company and to maintain our regulatory capital standards. Holy smokes. We started I with mean, the process. Members listening to this? He is cutting the one person that is telling him, hey, wait, you are going to go over a cliff. Cutting that and he is saying, well, we have got to cut across the boards. Now, your, your credit uh, risk officer, uh, told you in a memo uh, that far from, said that you were operating far from current market practices. He said, this is a direct quote, we are not even close to having proper control processes for credit, market, and, uh, and operational risk. And then he went on to say, I get a 16 percent budget cut. And he suggested um, that there was malice involved. Now, what I want to find out was this calculated. You know, this is one of the concerns that we have. That it's not that this wasn't a case of a cop walking off a beat. This was a case of a cop being told, "Don't go there," not by not giving him enough resources. Why did you do that? Explain this to the American people. Why did you make a decision to I will cut your credit risk I will explain it to you office? by reading to you the response to him, which was part of a conversation, Representative. It is not fair to take an email that's in a train of emails that has a response right behind it that says. If you feel the process is not working, you know my door. Telephone and house are open to you. I am not aware that you have sought to do so on this topic. And if, of course, you may say that anything you believe to be true at any time to anyone on the board or anywhere else, this is my response to him. And I believe it is inaccurate for you to suggest anyone expressed a view there are enough resources for everyone to do everything necessary for the plan. Resources are tight. Everyone has cuts. Come and see me. Do you take That's responsibility then? That was the process. Do you take we responsibility for that. the risks that your company took when you ignored? the advice of your credit risk officer and when you cut the budget, do you take that responsibility? I followed the process to listen to all of my staff, not just the chief but risk officer. But what did officer. you do, though? What did you do? Did you cut the, the budget of your credit uh, risk officer? Just like all budgets, ah, as long as I have been yes, involved in business, we negotiated the right number for is the, the people that Is the answer yes or no? Did you cut your credit risk officer's budget? As you know, giving an answer yes or no to the question would not be accurate. I will give Can you, you an answer the response. question. The gentleman's yes, time has expired. I will give you an accurate response. And the answer is that budgets are determined as a result of a back and forth between executives that have purview on it. His budget was subsequently increased from where it had been placed. He could not hire everybody that he needed because there was huge demand for risk officers all around the financial markets. So we appropriately adjusted it and gave him the opportunity to come back in should he be able to hire above that rate. So you yes. are you're, you're testifying that you increased his budget. Is that what you are telling us, Congress? We negotiated the budget the same as we did every year for time immemorial. Then Not credible. To criticize uh, that it's been a pleasure serving with you over the last 20 years. It's been a delight. And of course, uh, we had an opportunity to work on many issues together. Well, I was um, reluctant to step up because I thought I might get a little teary eyed because I love this committee and I congratulate you as being the new chairman and uh, the ranking member, um, Mr. Daryl Issa. And I know this committee will do well. 
I also am reluctant because um, this issue is very sore to me because we knew a long time ago the train was going to crash. Everyone at this table knew the train was going to crash. And the people who warned are the ones who took the hit. And, the, and you all just continued to make a lot of money. Uh, and ultimately, to the harm of the, the very people we wanted to help. It's, it's kind of surreal. You had Richard Baker, who was pointing out that Fannie and Freddie had problems and they needed to have proper regulation. After the Financial Service Committee had a landmark hearing on Enron, and uh, we passed Sarbanes-Oxley, I said, well, this is good. Fannie and Freddie are finally going to have to pay by some rules. And then Richard said, but they're not under the 1933 and 34 Act, so they're not going to be under Sarbanes-Oxley. So I said, fine, let's deal with it. And, and Ed Markey, Democrat, and I just said, OK, let's regulate Fannie and Freddie like any other company in 2002 and 2003. Well, I'll tell you, something hit the fan because every lobbyist that I've ever met was knocking down our door. Uh, Fannie and Freddie paid lobbyists to lobby for them, and they paid lobbyists on retainers so they wouldn't lobby against them. Uh, and so we have $175 million spent in 10 years on lobbying Congress. And this is a quasi-government organization that felt it had to manipulate Congress, and it did. It had a hugely weak regulator with Ofeo. And uh, Mr. Raines, you didn't want a stronger regulator. You didn't want the 2002 Act. You didn't want the 2003 Act. What fascinates me is you even argued that just to set aside a 3% uh, made sense when banks have to set aside 8 or 9%. And you're getting $90 million uh, for your good work. Um, it, it, it just is almost surreal to be at this hearing and to hear you. If I were critical of this administration, I would say that they cared so much about loyalty that loyalty trumped the truth. And they failed to hold people accountable. But we're still in Congress failing to hold people accountable. Whether you're Republicans or Democrats, you're not being held accountable. I hope this new administration starts to hold people accountable. Mr. Raines, do you still believe that setting aside less than 3% uh, for potential losses was financially wise? You made that argument in the Financial Service Committee. Mm -hmm. Do you still believe that that was a wise thing to do? Well, I think we have some evidence on that with regard to uh, Fannie Mae's portfolio, as I understand it. The requirement uh, to, uh, for capital uh, was approximately 2.5 percent for the mortgage portfolio and the on-balance sheet portfolio. And there have not been uh, losses uh, in that area that, it, that exceeded that capital. The losses that Fannie Mae has reported, as I understand them, have come from the credit side, not from the uh, portfolio side. So based on this unique experience, it appears that that is sufficient capital for the portfolio. Mr. Raines, you're not just speaking to this committee. You're speaking to the whole financial sector. You are making the argument that setting aside only 3 percent is was financially a wise thing to do. I'm not going to change your answer. I just want to make sure that you, with a straight face, are saying that was a wise thing to do. It is proven in the current circumstances that we I'd like a yes or no. Yes, it was, or no, it wasn't. It has worked. Congressman, it, it worked with regard to the portfolio. On the credit business, it's a different thing. And we were talking in the committee, in the Financial Services Committee, about the portfolio. Because ironically, the criticism of Fannie Mae in those days was its on balance sheet portfolio, which in fact has not been the problem now. The problem has been the credit business that people were arguing that's all that Fannie Mae should do Mr. Raines, was the credit when, business. When we finally got uh, Fannie and Freddie to agree to be under the 34 Act, we learned that both Fannie and Freddie had cooked their books, overstated income, and uh, you ultimately had to leave. I'm just curious to know, um, do you still believe that Fannie shouldn't be under the 33 and 34 Act and play by the rules that no one else has to play by? <laughs> The, uh, at this point, I don't think it matters. Uh, Fannie Mae is already registered with the SEC, so including uh, Fannie Mae as a registrant. On the 34 Act. I understand. I was going to get to that. You mentioned both acts, I believe. 
that with regard to the registration, I don't think it matters a lot. With regard to the uh, overall uh, registration uh, of its securities, uh, particularly the mortgage-backed securities, uh, I think that the, the damage uh, that I foresaw at that time would be less now given all the convulsions that have already gone on in the marketplace. I think that the, uh, the market for mortgage-backed securities is going to have to be reconstructed anyway. Uh, so I think it's just a matter of process at this point. But I don't think it matters one way or the other. You, you, uh, you think that, uh, Mr. Mr. Chairman, I'd ask unanimous consent that Mr. Shays have just one additional minute. Thank you. Um, just the bottom line question. In other words, uh, the 33 and 34 Act were designed to protect the public. Mm -hmm. Fannie and Freddie are not under the 33 Act. They voluntarily got under the 34 Act. Because they got under it is when we learned that they couldn't comply with basic accounting standards. That's when we learned it. Had we not put them under the 34 Act, we never would have learned that. And your comment to me is it doesn't matter if they are under the 33 or 34 Act? No, I said that because it's Fannie Mae is now a registrant, it would be redundant to include them. But if you would like to include them in the, under the Act, I think that's fine. I don't think it would change anything about the registration. How about the 33 Act? 33 Act, as I said, I was fearful that it would disrupt the mortgage-backed securities market. Right now, the market is so disrupted that I don't think adding a, a registration requirement would do any more harm. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Fannie and Freddie lost a significant share of the secondary mar mortgage market uh, by 2004 as private Wall Street uh, companies bought increased numbers of subprime and Alt-A loans. Uh, Mr. Mudd, I want to ask about decisions Fannie made to regain some of this ground. On June the 26th and 27th of 2006, Fannie Mae executives attended a retreat in Cambridge, Maryland uh, for its senior management group. The committee obtained a document that lists the highlights from that meeting. The document was circulated to you and other top executives on July 7, 2006. The document summarizes what we accomplished, the key takeaways from our sessions, the open issues to address, and corporate strategies next steps. Um, under the section titled New Business Model and Growth Initiatives, the memo describes a new approach for Fannie Mae's Single Family Mortgage Division. It says this, Single Family Strategy is to say yes to, uh, to our customers by increasing purchases of subprime and Alt-A loans. Mr. Mudd, based on this summary, there was detailed discussion at the retreat in 06 about whether to enter the subprime and on a market. And the, and the decision was made to say yes to these types of loans. The memo says this initiative uh, will generate attractive returns, but was there any discussion about the increased risk involved? Uh, yes, sir. That was an intimate discussion in the process. And so when we, uh, when we first entered the subprime market. And, and I would fast forward to the end of the story and say that once we got there, we realized we didn't like it that much, so it didn't grow very much. But the analysis that you are asking about at the time was, if we enter this market, what are the appropriate forms of risk mitigation and so forth? So typically uh, what we did was we actually bought bonds in small numbers and we bought the highest rated uh, AAA tranches of those bonds and in some cases actually bought supplemental uh, insurance on top of those bonds. That then gave us some exposure to the marketplace that we could evaluate and uh, assess whether it was a market we could be in. And, in D and by the way, we also set uh, standards that said that those bonds had to be, the, the, under the loans, any subprime loans we were involved in, had to be originated under a very specific set of conditions uh, that gave us some assurance there, there would be no predatory features in them. So with those, those two pillars, we had some exposure <laughs> to the market. We saw it. We didn't like it that much. And that's why you see from the numbers it didn't grow very quickly. Okay. Fannie acted quickly uh, on, on, on this new business model. For example, Fannie purchased more than $200 billion in Alt-A loans in 06 and 07, according to the data provided to this committee. 
uh, by the Federal Housing Finance Agency. Uh, in retrospect, it seems that the decision made at this retreat in 06 to increase your company's purchases of subprime and Alta mortgages was a major mistake. Do you agree? Well, again, separating out the subprime and the alt A, now addressing the alt A, can you look back in retrospect and say that you wish you had less alt A business? Yes, absolutely. Well, the the uh, numbers speak for themselves. I think you know. Last month, Fannie reported almost 4.3 billion dollars in credit losses uh, for uh, for 08 so far. Almost half of these losses came from your investments in the risky Alt-A uh, mortgages, especially those originated in 06 and 07. Do you agree with that? The, certainly a, uh, a high proportion of losses has come out of, uh, has come out of the Alt-A book, yes. And certainly if you look back in retrospect and say based on what you know now, would you have as much exposure in Alt-A? No you, no, you wouldn't. But we, based on the information that we had at the time, based on where we saw the market at the time, based on the evolution of our own standards, and based on the prudential things that we did to, and got a lot of criticism, criticism for, increasing price, increasing standards, requiring more documentation was there, was important. And by the way, the Alt-A loans on Fannie Mae books have performed a factor of two better than any of the Alt-A I mean, loans in the marketplace at large. So I think some, some of those processes were helpful. Were they ultimately helpful you. enough? Thank you for that. Goes to your question. For that response. Um, the memo also said we discussed additional growth ideas that warrant further exploration, including a new acquisitions method to buy all loans. What does it mean to have a policy to buy all loans that doesn't sound like risk is considered at all? No, it doesn't, and that wasn't, in fact, uh, the policy, Congressman. Uh, the challenge that we were facing in the marketplace at that time was because of the, um, the footprint, or we called it the, the, the box of loans that mm -hmm. Fannie Mae would actually accept, originators were, were originating product that was outside that box. Mm -hmm. It was difficult for them to segregate the loans that they could only sell to Fannie Mae from the all other category. So we had a number of initiatives in place to say, could we provide an upfront solution so they would have kind of one stop shopping, but that we would never take on those risks that were either risks that we didn't like or risks we couldn't price for or loans that were perhaps jumbos or something like that. That was the subject of that study. So you took the bundles time is, that were time good time and bad all together. I'm sorry. Yeah. The gentleman's time has expired. But you can answer the question. I, I'm sorry, sorry, Chairman. I didn't hear the I, question. Uh, the question was, you you took bundles that were combined with good and bad mortgages, good and bad loans. N no, uh, the, the the purpose of that project was specifically not to take the loans that we weren't comfortable with, but to continue to attract the business of our customers that was the traditional business that we had done, or the business that we could price and were comfortable with. Right. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Yes, Mr. Mr. Turner. Mr. Chairman, I apologize. Yeah. Yes. I apologize. Uh, I, could I take a brief break? Sure. Sure. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Mr. Chairman, well, that's, well, that's occurring. May I accompany? <laughs> I'm sorry. May I do the same thing while that's occurring? You, you may. Thank you me. may. Yeah. Why don't we just take a five minute recess? Okay. We will now recognize the gentleman from Ohio, Mr. Turner, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Raines, I, I want to uh, read you a portion of your written testimony. You make a statement that I think is, is very important in your written testimony that I agree with about the CRA. And in your statement, you say a very common allegation that has been made is that the Community Reinvestment Act forced mortgage originators to make loans that were too risky and burden banks with assets that would later default. It is on page 11. This claim is incorrect. The most risky loans in the system tended to be originated by lenders not covered by CRA. Um, the statement that, that you are making there, I hear from a lot of 
uh, CRA covered banks, lenders, mm -hmm. who then go the next step though and say that they are not as, as at fault or at fault for the mortgage lending crisis because their loans which they originated um, were not those that many of us would identify as predatory or even in the, in the subprime area. Mm -hmm. And my thoughts in that are that by, by their actually then buying the mortgage-backed securities of these subprime or these predatory uh, loans, they are providing the fuel back for those types of loans that they claim that they weren't originating. In other words, they from the back door buy mm -hmm. those things that they are not selling out the front door mm -hmm. and then provide gasoline or fuel to allow more of those loans to occur. And so they are having participated in purchasing those and in using their capital to buy them, uh, helped fund what was the practice, what were the practices that in fact were the problem. Um, would you agree with that? Well, I think uh, you have a, a very legitimate uh, point as to at what stage are you uh, providing uh, necessary funds to the market and at what stage have you moved over into encouraging practices that aren't good market practices. I mean, most subprime loans you know, go to people you know, like my father who simply didn't have a lot of income and didn't have a great credit rating and he had to go to the finance company to get finance. That is what an original subprime loan was. You went to HFC and they gave you a loan and it was backed by your house that you had some equity in it. Over time, as I point out in my testimony, these loans morphed into other things. Instead of it being a loan on your house that you already own, that you have equity, subprime loans became loans to buy houses where you had no equity. Instead of it being people who had a long track record of paying their bills but just simply every now and then fell behind, it came people who had just gotten out of bankruptcy. So not all subprime loans are bad. A chunk of them are very bad and they have been very bad for consumers. And it is very hard for your banker to know in the mortgage-backed security that he is buying, does this only include the good ones or does this also include predatory ones? That is one reason why back as early as I think 1999 we published standards on subprime lending as to what Fannie Mae would buy and wouldn't buy to try to establish some but, standards but in the market. Is, just a second, Mr. Ains, but they, they did know. I mean, they did know both uh, from the information that was being received on uh, the, um, uh, the, the uh, default rates, the foreclosure rates, uh, the, uh, the sloppy um, uh, underwriting processes, the lack of documentation, the loan to value ratios that had, had been, been changed. Uh, they did know that these were the more risky ones and that these were those that, that you would not want to encourage either for a borrower or really for mm -hmm. the assets for the overall bank. Um, and and I would want to go the next step, Mr. Ains, because you mm -hmm. said exactly what, you, what, what I thought you would say, which I agree with, that where do you cross the line of actually encouraging back bad behavior uh, versus uh, just participating in the market. And that is what I believe that Freddie and Fannie did. It is not just the, the CRA covered bank that, that uh, had one uh, originating loan standards on the front door and bought mortgage backed mm -hmm. securities out the back that had bad standards. It, it was Freddie and Fannie also. You provided fuel, uh, all of you gentlemen, by providing fuel um, for these loans by buying them up. You encouraged an area of the market to both expand, recapitalizing them so that they can go out and do more of these without providing the, uh, the types of standards necessary to protect the borrowers, to protect the public, or to protect your shareholders. Um, <clears throat> Mr. Uh, Mr. Siren, you stated that um, the market had mar migrated away from traditional loans. Uh, you are supposed to be an organization that has a knowledge of that that tradition is not just based on some archaic structure that we all knew when, when my parents first went to buy their first home. It is based upon sound business principles. Mr. Siren, you went on to say you know, well, you, we were doing what we needed to to serve our shareholders. Your shareholders haven't been served. I can't imagine one of you today can sit here and say that the conditions of your companies uh, are such that you were following practices that were shareholder directed. They weren't borrower directed. Uh, they weren't our, our, our Federal um, um, mortgage processes directed. And they certainly haven't ser served the taxpayer. Sir, you, well, sir. A, a couple of points. First, I think you are absolutely correct that even though a lot of these changes uh, provided other opportunities that 
in retrospect, we would have been a lot better off if the market had stayed in its more traditional source. But neither Fr and, Fannie and didn't you have a role in that? I mean, didn't you have an ability? Didn't you have a role in that? Didn't you no. have an ability to both no. raise your hand and say what needs to be done in, in, on the regulatory side to prevent the market from migrating there and have a role to not enter the, that market area by funding it and fueling it? Well, sir, we, we, didn't, we didn't have any capacity to constrain the, the growth of that market uh, is, is uh, is what I would say. In the second part of your question, I think that what we did, and I really firmly believe this, is, and I'm, I'm not saying we didn't make mistakes, we did uh, what we thought was the right thing at the time, but you're absolutely right. It's hard to say that uh, the shareholders or any of us uh, who, were, who were shareholders uh, benefited from that. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Time has expired. Gentleman from Massachusetts, Mr. Lynch. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And briefly, I just want to congratulate Chairman Waxman in his absence for his great work on this committee as well. He will be sorely missed. Uh, I want to uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, for the time and also to the ranking member. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I would ask that the American Enterprise Institute article entitled The Last Trillion Dollar Commitment, The Destruction of Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac uh, by Peter J. Wallison and Charles W. Calamiris be entered into the record. Without objection, so ordered. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, just as an initial uh, matter of clarification, uh, it was asked earlier by the ranking member, I believe, uh, whether uh, 660 was used as your, your dividing line for, for all day uh, mortgages, uh, Mr. Mudd, and uh, probably you as well, Mr. Siren. Uh, I'm looking at some Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac documents here, and it appears that you use a FICO score of 620 as the as the dividing line. Is that correct? Uh, in our in our case, um, please don't burn my time. This is just a simple matter. Is it 620 or 660? No. 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 You use 660 then. No. You don't use 660. You don't use 620. The, the what do you use? The, uh, the, def the original definition of a subprime loan was based upon the originator. When the market developed other oh, definitions, God. we disclosed what is based it, on sir? the other definitions that were used in the marketplace. Okay. This is consistent. You know what? You know what I can tell you right now. You, if you have accomplished anything here today, you have made conservatorship look very, very good. I was very worried about that decision to put these organizations in in, in conservatorship. But what I have seen here today. With the total denial that's going on here today and, and the, the refusal to answer simple questions, whether you put the budget up or you put the budget down and you can't answer that, it just gives me great comfort, great reassurance that these two GSEs are now in the hands of conservators. Because I can see what led us into this problem just by the way that you've been, uh, failure to, you're, you've been failing to respond. Uh, despite all the denials of, of what's going on here, I happen to have some of the documents that were submitted here. Uh, this is a 10Q investor summary for the quarter ended June 30, 2008. And uh, let's see, Fannie reported that mortgage, this is for Fannie Mae, that uh, subprime characteristics, com mortgages with subprime characteristics comprise substantial percentages of all 2005 through 2007 uh, mortgages that the company acquired. And there's some tables here that, that are shown as, as well. If you add up, this is Fannie's report, if you add up the categories and, and eliminate uh, double counting, and this is also in the Wallison uh, Calamiris uh, article, it appears that on June 30th, 2008, the reporting date, just after the time that you left, I believe, Mr. Mudd, uh, around the time that you, you left, Fannie either held or had guaranteed subprime and Alt-A loans, however that's defined, uh, with an unpaid principal balance of $553 billion. In addition, according to the same Fannie Mae report, the company also held $29.5 billion of Alt-A loans and $36.3 billion of subprime loans that it had purchased as private label securities. And these figures amount to the grand total of $619 billion uh, and, and reflect a huge commitment to the purchase of mortgages of questionable quality between 2005 2007. We also, we've appointed, as I said before, we have a, a new regulator in town, a new sheriff. And I'm going to quote from him. This is Jim Lockhart, who now heads up the FHFA. 
Here's what he says. This is in a report that, that he gave. Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac purchased and guaranteed many more low dock, low verification and non-standard mortgages in the 2000 and two, 2000, 2006 and 2007 uh, uh, years than they had in the past. Roughly 33 percent of the company's business involving buying or guaranteed these risky mortgages compared with 14 percent in 2005. Those bad debts on mortgages led to billions of dollars in losses at these two firms and affected the capacity to raise capital to absorb further losses and, and force them to go to the, the Treasury uh, for support. Now, let me ask you, the way we set up this whole organization where you have, as we've said before, you have an obligation to your shareholders, and we've talked about that. Uh, my, my colleague uh, previously uh, mentioned that. There's also the liquidity uh, function here, and you're trying to shore up the markets. We're going to have to look further down the road at the possibility, perhaps, of going into a receivership, and Fannie and Freddie will go away. Do you think, in looking back, that that created a conflict, your obligation to the shareholder, where you're going for return? And I know that's what you're going for with some of this stuff here. This was making a lot of money at one point. Is, is that a core problem with the way these organizations are structured now? And I'll, I'll just take my answer and yield back my time. Thank you. Um, but Congressman, first, I, I would apologize. I, I, I was, you asked a question about the definitions, and I wanted to be as precise as I, as I could. And if I can follow up by writing or individual, I will. I, I, don't, I don't mean be great. Not, not to answer your, your question anyway. Um, on the second question, um, uh, what I found personally was that uh, due to the hybrid nature of the company, a uh, private company with a public mission, uh, that uh, charter, that structure gives rise to uh, a number of challenges that become conflicts, that become this very difficult balancing act that you described between shareholders, homeowners, taxpayers, capital, liquidity, stability, which market to be in. Uh, in a good market, in a rising market, it's possible to make the trade-offs to keep that balance in a pretty effective place. In a crisis of these proportions, you can't manage the dial. And as you know from your work on the Financial Services Committee, you could see that some of the dials we had to suboptimize, whether, whether it was in terms of the affordable housing mission or the liquidity mission at any given point in time. So, yes, I think the current structure needs to be revisited, but my hope would be to revisit it in the context of what Congress wants the overall housing finance market and the government's involvement in that to look like thence how Fannie and Freddie fit into it, rather than having an answer provided for Fannie and Freddie and then the rest of the market gets rebuilt uh, around that without sufficient debate and examination. Right. Thank you. Thank you. And would time. you like to have a crack at that just briefly? Uh, I'm sorry? Would you like to have a crack at that answer, uh, yes, that question? Uh, yes, sir. Uh, uh, I think, as I said, these organizations have provided a lot of value in the past. There's been a lot of change that going on, going on. I agree with Mr. Mudd completely. That we, that we have to uh, look at how this fits into the whole system. And with, very quickly, with respect to the balancing of, of the three, I think in an up market it was a, it was a lot easier. But th essentially what you were trying to do in these companies, you could never make any one of the three completely happy. It was how you could sort of minimize the, the unhappiness and make it feasible. Thank you. Thank you. And Mr. Chairman, I appreciate your forbearance. Thank you, sir. I yield back. Um, Gentleman from California, Mr. Bill Bray. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Gentlemen, a colleague of mine used the reference perfect storm. Can we agree that this was not an act of God? It wasn't just something that happens, that this was a situation that was um, created, nurtured, and triggered by human activity. Can we agree to that? Yes, or do sir. you agree with a perfect storm, that no. it was just this happens and there was nothing anybody could do about it? Well, Congressman, if uh, you are addressing the question to me, I, I agree way. with you that it is the result of human beings making decisions. And I laid out in my written testimony uh, how not only in this storm, but in other storms, it has been a result of human beings making a variety of decisions in the financial markets. Okay. My, you know, my concern is I feel like I am in 10, 15 years, I am going to have power plant owners come to us for all of these grants because their power plants are being washed out by major storm activity and say, 
We had nothing to do with this. Greenhouse gases, well, who would have thought? But I'm just saying down the line there was contributing factors here. Um, okay, it wasn't an act of God. When you looked at the market, the residential housing market, and the increase that we were seeing over a period of time, far beyond what we saw in the 70s, the, 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 the other um, climbs we've seen before, was anybody suspicious at all that, as we'd say in the environmental community, that this bubble was not sustainable? That if you look at the population growth, both birth rate and immigra immigration, it didn't justify the market expansion that we saw, did it? When we saw the way this market was growing, where was the market coming from? Where was the demand coming from? Now, Greenspan testified that there were two major factors. One, major portion of foreign investment coming in, buying paper, and creating an artificial, basically the fact that sight unseen, you get, a, you get this paper out there, we'll buy it, and the values kept going. And a lot of that being petro, our own petrodollars coming back from third world. But the other part, you've got to admit, was that the expanded market that you were creating by going out on this thin ice with this, this um, all day. I mean, this really was going out on ice. Can you at least admit that a contributing factor was the entire industry going out on this thin ice and broadening the market that created the bubble? Because you keep saying, once the bubble popped, what could we do? But the creation of the bubble itself, this mm -hmm. artificial um, inflated market out there, was not an act of God. It was an act of foreign massive foreign capital coming in far beyond what was reasonable and the expansion of the market and not just the low income but mm -hmm. middle class. I have a constituent, five defaults, oh no, seven defaults I think she had on people buying and selling in the market. Can you at least admit that the bubble was created partially by your loan, the, the, the institutions that were out there create, uh, giving loans to people who never should have qualified, thus broadening the market and inflating the value? I would say that the, uh, the, the, the expansion of credit that went all the way back to the 1990s and went through the consumer sector as well as the commercial sector combined with the, with the, the lack of affordable housing and the increase in housing prices all built up that bubble, yes. But Mr. Mudd, let's talk about this too. Talk about self creating the crisis. Didn't the availability and the expansion of the market through giving loans that weren't qualified was a major contributing factor to the acceleration of the, the uh, appreciation of residential housing. The cost was going up because you were responding to it too. Uh, uh, Congressman, I think you rightly um, describe it as a circular problem and the more one thing happened, the more it led to the other thing and the more the homes were unaffordable, the more the products got stretched in order to create products that people who <laughs> five years before might not have been qualified, could be qualified today. And that then led but to But just by there. the act, be it good intention or not, be it Congress or be it, be it the private sector, providing the market to people who couldn't afford it was causing the price of the affordability to go move out beyond them some more. Because it did contribute to the inflationary, the, the appreciation of real estate. Because you had more people that were in the market they could buy than you would have otherwise, right? You were describing a classic financial bubble, and I think you're, you're right. And I, as I tried to set forth in my testimony, in my written testimony, we have seen this again and again and again, that this is how we end up in financial crises by ordinary products being morphed into something different, and then it ke keeps feeding on itself until a point in which time where the market can no longer support it. Mr. Raines, I was involved 18 years with affordable housing. Explain to me how you can provide affordable housing to people who can't afford it normally and at a time that income and salaries are static, basically static over 20 years, mm -hmm. while the price of housing was skyrocketing, the gap was growing. How do you maintain the ability for that, the, that population to stay in the market that's moving beyond them without somewhere down the road subsidizing them one way or the other, filling that gap. How does the, how does the public sector do that without somebody, let's say private or private, filling that gap with a subsidy? 
Well, I think you and I have probably spent about a similar period of time with affordable housing, and I think you're, the answer is that in that circumstance there has to be a subsidy. Uh, we were lucky during much of the 1990s uh, that the, we had incomes rising uh, faster, and therefore with some engineering you could help people who are close to the edge to get into housing. But at a time when home prices were rising as quickly as they were in the early part of this decade, it made it almost impossible for affordable housing to work. Mr. Chairman, I, let me just point out that I think the bailout was the hidden subsidy, not just the low income but the middle income, to go into markets that they sh shouldn't have been into and that this bailout ought to be recognized as the end product of the fact that there was a subsidy and that subsidy was the bailout and the taxpayers are paying right now to subsidize those decisions that have been made over the, over the last two decades. Thank you very much, gentlemen. I appreciate thank, it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and I, too, want to thank you, gentlemen, for being here. I have two basic questions uh, for the panel. They are, what mistakes did you make that may have contributed to the current financial crisis, and what can we learn from these mistakes to guide us as we reform and reshape Freddie and Fannie? Let me just begin with you, Mr. Mudd. You were quoted in the New York Times on August 5, 2008, as saying, you have got the worst housing crisis in U.S. recorded history, and we are the largest housing finance company in the country, so when one goes down, the other goes with it, end of the quotation. Do you believe that your company's financial strategies played no role in its problems? Can you look back and identify any decisions you made that ultimately were harmful to your company and may have contributed to the crisis? Um, I, I can, Congressman, and thank you for the question. Um, uh, I think that the, st the, st the, the structure of the companies as monoline companies in the housing industry, in a housing market like this, uh, presents a challenge and ought to be considered going forward because you don't have the ability, as another financial institution would, to diversify. So when the housing market goes down, the commercial market goes up, or there is some balancing. In that light, uh, what, what, what do I wish I had done differently? I wish I had gone earlier in the process uh, to the regulator, to the Treasury Department, and said, you know, we are, we are struggling to maintain this balance between affordability and liquidity and capital and funding and housing goals and costs, uh, which one do you want us to, to emphasize? Because uh, the longer that we keep trying to balance these areas and be the sole, support, sole source of support in a declining uh, housing market, the more difficult challenge this becomes. So, so, so that is one thing that I, I wish I had done differently. I wish I had stayed longer and had been able to help more with the foreclosure problem, which has now come uh, to the fore. That, that, as you know, is really the place where the rubber meets the road on this. Uh, while I was there, we were able to modify, I think, about 200,000 loans in order to help people either refinance into safer loans or avoid a foreclosure. I think it is apparent uh, now, in retrospect, that more sooner to avoid those foreclosures would have been better for the, for the overall market. Thank you very much. Let me ask you, Mr. Raines. Um, I would like to hear your view about what mistakes were made either during your tenure or after you left. I am sorry. I would uh, point to uh, a couple of things during my tenure uh, that I wish had been done differently. I wish we could have gotten a uh, regulatory bill relating to Fannie and Freddie uh, enacted uh, earlier, uh, because I think that the battle over Fannie and Freddie uh, was a distraction uh, to the companies, to our regulator, uh, and as well to uh, other parts of the uh, financial system regulatory process. Uh, and so I, I wish that we could have gotten that done uh, at a much earlier stage in time which I think would in these times have uh, provided some real assurance to the market uh, about the uh, future of the companies. I also wish that we had uh, been able to complete before I left the process of uh, fully entrenching the risk management approach to credit that we had worked out over a couple of year period 
that uh, I believe would have been helpful to uh, my uh, successors in managing the extraordinary uh, credit uh, issues that they had to face uh, after uh, I left. Uh, with regard to my successors, I am really not in a position to judge them. I don't have the facts. I wasn't there. It would be unfair for me to say, well, sitting here today, here is what I would have done differently. I tried in my testimony simply to point out what I thought were the facts that the, that, that the company has uh, uh, disclosed. But I don't really feel in a position to critique what they are doing without knowing what they know. Thank you very much. Let me just quickly ask uh, Mr. Siren and Mr. Uh, Vincel, answering the same questions, uh, could you uh, indicate any feeling of mistakes or errors or things that could have been done differently? Yes, sir. Uh, what I wish uh, that we had done is, and, and we tried to do this, insisted on uh, more precision or some precision and how these uh, trade-offs uh, should have been dealt with. For example, I had suggested that simple regulatory language that said that we should have, we, we needed to be uh, fulsome uh, on our mission, be safe and sound, and provide uh, a return uh, to shareholders that was competitive. I mean, I, I think something, something that, that would have helped uh, determining how this balance should be met over time. Thank you. Um, yes, I've, uh, of course, I was the CEO of Freddie Mac for a long time, and uh, over the course of those years, I made uh, many mistakes in the in the process, and I learned from uh, uh, mistakes as well. And I think certainly what I learned is strong controls over credit and credit policies uh, are critical to the long-term survival, not only of the organization but also of uh, uh, home buyers in the nation. Uh, beyond that, though, uh, I left in 2003, and at the time I felt that our approach in the subprime market, uh, focusing on being very conservative and cautious, was the appropriate one. And I think that is proven uh, to, to be true. I can't say really uh, what has happened since then in terms of the decisions that were made, the appropriateness of the decisions is clear based on public uh, statements uh, that uh, the subprime investments have proven to be a problem uh, for Freddie Mac and Fannie Mae subsequently. Um, my, certainly, I'd, with regard to regrets, uh, I think the issue about a, a strong professional regulator that is credible and has the confidence of uh, the public, of uh, uh, members of Congress and of investors is of critical importance and continues to be. And I think that uh, uh, that was at least a source of concern in the early 2000s that uh, I would have, uh, as Mr. Rain said, I think uh, I wish I had been more effective on uh, working towards. Finally, of course, as has been briefly mentioned, Freddie Mac did go through a restatement uh, in uh, 2003. Um, uh, it's interesting, of course, that the restatement result resulted in Freddie Mac uh, reporting more income rather than less. But nevertheless, uh, uh, that restatement happened under my watch as a CEO, and uh, I wish that, uh, number one, the restatement had not been necessary, and uh, I still continue to kind of search through what I might have done differently in that regard. The gentleman's time has expired. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Congressman Sally of Idaho. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, gentlemen, I have to tell you I am a little surprised that I am I'm getting this impression that all of you feel that uh, Fannie and Freddie uh, and the difficulties that we find ourselves in now was just because you were victims of a market. Um, Mr. Siren, I think you described the mission uh, for your organization while you were there is, is uh, liquidity, affordability, and stability. Did I get those three right? Yes, sir. Well, I think that each of you would agree that to, uh, I, I don't know what the exact numbers are, but somewhere around close to half of the residential market uh, was funded through uh, Freddie and Fannie together. Uh, in fact, it's been described uh, as, as two uh, GSEs that were too big to fail. You all agree with that characterization, don't you? Does anybody disagree with that 
characterization. Okay, fine. Um, we heard a description earlier that there was this perfect storm, and I think as uh, Congressman Bill Bray pointed out, a storm is an act of God and there is no control over that. Now, you would all agree that as the biggest stakeholder in the residential mortgage market, that you'll have a significant impact on that market. Does anybody disagree with that? Okay. And uh, you'd probably agree that it's not unreasonable to give the biggest stakeholder in the residential mortgage market the mission of bringing stability to that market. Does anybody disagree with that? And given that the Alt-A uh, loans failed, I think, at something like 10 times the rate of other loans, and that at the time that they were being made, they were mockingly referred to as liar loans. Uh, none of you would disagree that both Fannie and Freddie really failed in their mission, their charge of adding stability to the market by trying to meet the market with those Alt-A loans. Does anybody disagree with that? Uh, yeah, Congressman, I would I would disagree respect respectfully uh, in this in the sense that it is necessary to maintain a balance during that. I don't think that market share is a primary indicator of whether the company is being successful or not. It's a secondary indicator that says, are you remaining relevant to the market? Are people continuing we're, to but do But we're not business? talking about success. We're talking about stability. Right. And all day loans failing at 10 times the rate of other loans, that's not going to add stability to the market, is it? You'd agree with that? Yes. Okay. Um, now, each of you would uh, agree that during your time at, at Fannie and Freddie, you received more in bonuses than you did in your salaries. So that's a correct assessment, isn't it? Does anybody disagree with that? Um, and, and that would be true, Mr. Raines, in spite of that clawback that took back part of you, still received more in bonuses than you did in your salary. And uh, those bonuses increased, at least in part, on the pursuit and the resulting increased levels of Alt-A and or subprime loans. Any of you disagree with that? No, I would disagree with that. There was no part of your bonuses that was based on increased levels of Alt-A loans? That was not one of our goals in our compensation system to increase Alt-A loans, no. Because of the number of Alt-A loans, your bonuses went up. Is that a fair statement? Uh, because of the amount, the total amount of loans that were given? I don't believe so, no. It didn't increase the amount of loans, total loans that were given? It, Alt-A loans can increase the total volume of loans yes. you have, but that doesn't mean... And that, that increased your bonus, didn't it? No, it was not based on volume. It, it was based on profitability and pricing. So if you properly... And so if you have more volume, you have more profit. Is that not correct? Not necessarily. As we can see, having a lot of volume can create a lot of losses. So there is no, there is no necessary relationship between volume and profit. You hope you have both, but you have to work hard to get the profit part. The volume part's not that hard. So, okay, so your bonuses, you're saying that uh, your bonuses are based on volume and that the Alt-A loans had no uh, bearing on... I said, uh, I said my bonuses uh, were not based no, on volume. Prof profitability, not based on, on volume, based on profitability and that the Alt-A loans had nothing at all to do with the level of bonus that you got. Now, I said that the, it, the profitability of Alt-A loans, just like any other loans, okay. would have an impact on the bonus. Did the, did the fact that there were more Alt-A loans uh, that were uh, uh, funded by Fannie and Freddie, did it increase your bonuses at all? In my, yes in, my, no? in my case, I don't believe so, but I would have to go back to 2004. Remember, I left in 2004. So I'd have to go back to 2004 and see what impact it, it, it had. Alt-A loans were a very small percentage of the book of business when I was there, so I don't believe it had any impact on my bonus. It had no impact at all on the bonuses that you received. Is that your I testimony don't today? It did. That's what I, I believe it did not because it was such a small part of our business in 2004. It had no impact on your bonuses? I don't believe it did. Is, is that true for the rest of you as well? Yes. Uh, the last time I received a bonus was for the year 2001, and uh, 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 certainly it wasn't based on the amount of Alt-A mortgages uh, uh, that okay, we I'm not Okay, I'm not asking about the level. I'm asking about the fact that there were more Alt-A loans given, that you were trying to meet the market. Each of you agreed that that's what you were trying to do, no, no. that that increased your bonus. 
Do you, you disagree with that? I think you have to, in the case of Mr. Brunzel and myself, I think you have to separate the Alte market became dramatically larger later. It was growing during this time, but as a percentage of the book of business through 2004, the company's numbers show it was a small part of the business. My last bonus was 2003. Well, let, me was 2001. Mr. let me ask Mr. Mudd and Mr. Siren, is that true, is that true for you that the, the Alt-A loans increased your bonuses? Um, no, Congressman, because the goals that I had for most of that period reflected a wide range of things that weren't simply financial and would have included uh, restatement, regulatory settlements, a number of other things. So there weren't explicit goals that were tied to any given area, A. And B, the compensation was decided by an independent committee that I wasn't a member of. So part of the, an part of the answer, I think, that Mr. Raines and I, all, probably all of us would, would deal with, was we were not in the room at the time the discussion is being held. So you, you, don't, you, you have to factor that in mind, I believe. Sir, we also had an, uh, a compensation committee comprised of the independent directors. We had a, a balanced scorecard. The most important things on the balanced scorecard were uh, becoming SEC registered and uh, getting uh, financial statements for six years uh, uh, supp uh, supplied. Thank you very much. Uh, the gentleman from uh, Kentucky, Mr. Yarmouth. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I would like to um, also add for the record my uh, Congratulations and thanks to Chairman Waxman for the great leadership that he's provided this committee over the last two years. Uh, Mr. Siren and Mr. Mudd, <clears throat> you both said, in, I think in response to uh, Mr. Lynch's question, that you didn't have a problem handling things when values were going up. You could keep these, all these accounts in balance and so forth. And one of the things that I think we've learned in this series of hearings we've had on the financial crisis is that um, there are a lot of smart people when things are going well, and then you know, people are smart until they're not smart. And uh, one of the things that's happened is uh, when things turn bad and through a, across the spectrum, people have not been able to handle it well, or the, the institutions haven't. Um, the other thing we've learned is in, in case after case, we found institutions that were extremely highly leveraged. I mean, the case of uh, Lehman Brothers, it was a, basically a 30 to 1 leverage rate uh, risk versus um, their capital. And that's been pretty consistent throughout the, across the board. In May of this year, the New York Times reported that your companies had uh, net capital of about $83 billion, and, and that was against $5 trillion worth of debt, which is a leverage ratio of more than 50 to 1. Uh, in retrospect to, to both of you, do you think your companies were overly leveraged? Is that a, a problem that, um, was that one of the contributing factors to this crisis that you find yourselves in or found yourselves in? Well, I, I think in retrospect, sir, we have learned that the entire financial system uh, and the, and if I may say so, the household sector and the government sector in the United States uh, was over leveraged. Uh, I think our concern about leverage was that we have the, the same capital ratios, if you will, or leverage ratios for the same type of assets. This is a point we made all the time that our competitors would. But I think they could have been higher for everybody. Mr. Bodwin? Um, uh, if, if uh, hypothetically, if I were running the company on a going on a going forward basis, and I had the benefit of being able to factor in the real world experience of 07 and 08 uh, into the models and into the estimates, um, the, that data would, would, would introduce that there, there's, a, there's a much wider degree of variability than was ever seen in the history of the, of, of the U.S. housing market. So some of the question you are asking is, is I think going to be self-solving, not just for Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, but for, but for, uh, but for other financial ins institutions as, as well, simply because the, the data of a crisis of these proportions uh, didn't exist before, you know, I, I, they say 1938. I learned the other day that the last time the Bank of England got rates this low was 1641. So people have gone back quite a long ways to try to find this level of dislocation. Well, and going back to the question of, of leverage, though, um, was there ever any d discussion internally in your operations about whether you were, your risk was 
was in excess of your too far well, we, in excess we actually, of your assets? We, we actually were were uh, had had uh, raised capital and were carrying capital uh, during during the the this past year that was significantly higher than uh, than uh, regulatory standards. So uh, and we recognized that, and I had said publicly, this is the type of market in which you want to be long capital. So I, I think w while the, I, I don't know how you would debate the numbers, but the philosophy of wanting to go into a difficult market with strong capital is important. And also for folks to remember the reason that you have capital on the sunny days is so that you can weather the rainy days. And it shouldn't be a surprise that capital goes down as a crisis becomes more pointed. So I, I, I take it, and I am not trying to say you, you know, I am not questioning or second guessing with hindsight your judgment at the time, but you had more leverage than you should have had. You were over, le over leveraged in, in light of the circumstances. We were, care we were carrying the uh, we, we were carrying capital that was not not only met but exceeded all of the all of the regulatory standards. At I that understand time. the regulatory but, but standards, but from just logical, doesn't doesn't all of the leverage of this type doesn't it rely on the bigger th fool theory? Doesn't when you're leveraged 50 to one, doesn't that always assume that there's somebody there's a bigger fool who's going to continue to buy? Because if you have a normal default rate, um, if, if you have a normal if three or four percent default rate and you are leveraged 50 to 1, you are going to eat into capital. If you have a 10 percent leverage rate, you can experience a much higher default rate. Isn't that right? So you are assuming that this is almost an endless acceleration of prices to, to be able to leverage at that rate. Is that not true? Well, I, sir, I definitely think you, that, that you are you're on to the right issue and the ability of the level of capital in either a company or a GSE to be responsive to the market conditions is important. That is now, as I understand it, in, in the regulatory regime. Um, and back to my earlier point, the, the fact that we now have more robust data that shows what capital should look like in various stress scenarios will inform, I mean, what were after all models that were designed by, you know, that won Nobel Prizes. Uh, so, so, so I think that, that that will be helpful in that regard. Good. Thank you. <coughs> thank you very much. Um, the gentlewoman from North Carolina, Ms. Fox. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I, too, want to congratulate you on, on your new position and tell you I look forward to working with you and our ranking member. Um, there is so much to talk about here and so little time to do it, as my colleagues have said. But um, Mr. Yarmouth has just um, uh, injected a, an important issue, I think, into what we were talking about, as have some of my other colleagues. And I want to pose a question to you all that I am not going to ask you to answer until after I make some more comments. But um, I want to um, follow up on, on what Mr. Yarmouth was saying about it seemed that Mr. Mudd, you and others were always looking for things to get better because there is a quote here from the New York Times, almost no one expected what was coming. It is not fair to blame us for not predicting the unthinkable. Well, the question I want to ask you is um, how in the world can shareholders and even citizens of this country, when they have so much at stake in entities such as Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, how do we, and, and Oh, and back up, and you've all said that the main thing that you'd like to have done was to have stronger regulatory control, and I'll come back to that in a minute. So how do how do boards of directors uh, test people coming into their positions, not just as CEOs, but CFOs and these other positions, but you all have been CEOs, so that's what we're talking about. How do we test for backbone? How do we test for ethics? How do we test for a sense of vision? Um, and how do we test for people who are going to look at the full spectrum of issues, not just always looking for the sunny side of the street, but when, look, you, we need people who understand how to deal with crisis. You're saying it's unfair to ask you to uh, work in situations of crisis. What in the world were you getting paid millions of dollars to do? Simply ride the gravy train and always be there when things were good? For heaven's sakes, did you not have any sense that anything could ever go wrong under your watch and that you weren't responsible for that? You have 
exhibited no sense of accountability for your actions here, none. And that is disturbing to me and the American people. They expect us to be held accountable. And I want to say I appreciate the bipartisan nature of this hearing today. It's been the most bipartisan, I think, that we've had because we all agree there are problems. Administrations have created these problems, too. This is not a Democrat-Republican issue. We have people, we have members of Congress who are at fault, too. I wasn't here when these things were happening, but I want to come up to a, a, a point my, my colleague Mr. Shays brought up. And again, I'm going to leave time for you to answer your question. He made a comment that really triggered uh, my concern about this. We got them to agree to go under the 33 and 34 Act. You know, I'm just appalled as a member of Congress that members of Congress felt they had to get the agencies they regulate to agree to those regulations. What a, a situation we find ourselves in. Members of Congress don't have enough backbone themselves to do the kinds of regulations. And you're telling me, you, Mr. Raines, that the regulatory bill should have been enacted earlier, and yet you fought it tooth and nail. But now, in hindsight, you're willing to tell us it should have been regulated earlier. Uh, should have been more with risk management, but you fired the risk managers. Um, so you were afraid of being regulated because, again, as Mr. Shays said, uh, much of what has been found out that was wrong came about as the first real regulation. And you know, it's not just your shareholders, it's not just the people you uh, helped, but it's every American that's being affected by this because as a result of your actions, home prices all over this country have gone down. You, you really have uh, been irresponsible in what you've done and the people who worked for you. And I have quote after quote after quote. And I think part of the problem boils down to the amount of PAC money that was coming in from you guys and how much you spent to make sure that members of Congress would go easy on you in their regulations. And I hope that how the, what has come out about that has raised the awareness of the American people about the connection between those monies. And I love this committee. I got on it because it has the ability to investigate these kinds of things where the other committees have vested interest in what's happening and are often swayed by those very lobbyists that you hired to stop the kind of hearings going on today and the regulations. But now, 2020 hindsight, you want to. The gentlewoman's to time thank, has expired. Did they answer real fast their questions, Mr. Chairman? <laughs> okay, all right. If they thank remember. You. Okay, very quick. Because we, we want the American public to know what your advice is on that. Very quickly, because time is expired. Uh, Congresswoman, first of all, with regard to accountability, I have three full pages in my written testimony on the issue of my accountability. And therefore, I would hope that you would make uh, you would recognize that I have not been silent on that. We simply are not allowed to testify to everything we've got in our written statements. But I went to great lengths to point out that from the beginning, when there was a question raised about Fannie Mae and its accounting, I said I hold myself accountable. If the SEC finds we've made errors, I will hold myself accountable, and my board will. I retired early. I've had compensation clawed back. So it's unfair to say I have not accepted accountability for what happened when I was the CEO of the company. Mr. Benson. Yes, I uh, certainly uh, was, was accountable for what happened at uh, Freddie Mac uh, during my tenure. Your mic on. Your mic on. I'm sorry. Uh, I am and I was uh, held accountable for what happened to Freddie Mac during my tenure at, uh, at the company, uh, which ended in June of 2003. I do believe that with regard to the subprime market, and uh, that uh, I think that Freddie Mac behaved very responsibly under, under my tenure. Uh, my greatest accountability and ultimately uh, why uh, I left, I resigned from the company, of course, was a result of the uh, financial restatement that we uh, had to go through in, 
during 2003, which fortunately left the, the company it, it, with more capital than before, uh, but nevertheless it was still a restatement uh, uh, that the company should not have uh, gone through. Mr. Mudd. Uh, do I expect sunny days? No. I went to Mexico when the peso was devalued. I went to Asia when the 1998 crisis hit. I went to Beirut when there was shooting there. Um, people say that I like it too much when it's not a sunny day, so, so I would disagree with that. I would say that this time through, reality exceeded my imagination. And with respect to the 33 and the 34 Act, uh, we were agreeing to reverse a registration that a prior Congress had provided an exemption from. Uh, Mr. Siren. Thank you, sir. Uh, with respect to uh, foresight and seeing things going forward, uh, I was not as pessimistic uh, as uh, things eventually turned out. What I expected to happen was that housing prices would go down to being about flat in nominal terms and decline in real terms, but not catastrophically. Right. Mr. Chairman, Ranking Member Issa, thank you for holding this hearing. Uh, Mr. Chairman, there have been several references today during this hearing to a perfect storm. And I think it is important to remind everyone that in a perfect storm, the entire crew of the Andrea Gale perished. And the purpose of this hearing is because we have got paddles on the chests of two patients and we are trying to determine how much voltage to apply to resuscitate them. Mr. Mudd, I am going to start with you because you are one of the rare people who can say my name is Mudd with a straight face. Um, I want to start by asking you about an email exchange you had with your chief risk officer, Enrico Dallavacchia. For six months, beginning in March of 2006, Fannie Mae implemented a new business initiative to buy subprime loans. And under this program, Fannie concluded one deal to buy $74 million in subprime loans from a company called New Century, and it also began negotiating new deals. On August 16th of 2006, the Corporate Risk Management Committee approved a final plan to purchase up to $5 billion in whole subprime loans in 2006. Two months later, on October 28, 2006, which ironically is the same day the Great Depression really began in earnest, Mr. Dallavecchia, your chief risk officer, sent an email to you raising concerns about this huge increase in subprime purchases. And I am going to ask them to put that email up so that we can all take a look at it. And I want to read to you the portions that are in these call out boxes. Dan, I have a serious problem with the control process around subprime limits. Ramping up business much faster than we agreed upon less than two months ago is de facto preventing me to exercise my reserved authority to determine limits without damaging relationships with customers. Mr. Mudd, Mr. Dallavacchia is saying that you were ramping up too quickly on the subprime purchases and that this acceleration prevented him from determining appropriate risk limits. Isn't that true? Um, I'm sorry, sir. Could you repeat the, the question part of your question? Yes. What he's saying here is that your company was ramping up too quickly on subprime purchases and this acceleration was preventing him from determining appropriate risk limits. Isn't that true? I believe that's what he was saying in his note. Yes, sir. And then later in the email, if we can go to the next slide, he says, we approved twice in March and in June to buy subprime loans without having completed the new business initiative. And then in bold, this is a pattern emerging of inadequate regard for the control process. It seems like in this portion of the memo, your risk officer believed that you were rushing into billions of dollars worth of subprime loan purchases without really knowing what you were doing. Isn't that what he's saying here? Yes, and there's a part of the memo that's my response to him that's covered we're up get by, to the, that. by the box. We're going to get to which, that. Which th that furthers the conversation on the topic. Right. But when he sent this email to you, did you agree with his assessment? Uh, that's why I wrote above it, it's a serious matter and if the facts are supportive, you and I will come down hard. That's what it says above that. So he came and saw me. We went through the facts, we got the folks in the table, we had the discussion, and we went back to address those concerns. That was exactly the process, sir. Right. So let's go to that 
portion of the memo that you replied, and your reply was dated on Sunday, October 29th at 12.42 p.m., and as you've indicated, it says this is a serious matter, so you agreed with his assessment that it was a serious matter, correct? Yes. And then you said, and if the facts are supportive, we will come down hard. Were the facts supportive? Uh, as often happens in these type of situations, the facts were partially supportive. I would say in this case maybe even mostly supportive. So and did you come down hard? Yes, we did. What we, did you do? We, we called all of the people that were involved into the process uh, into the room, had a discussion, had a meeting, laid out the, laid out the rule. The, the, if I can just rewind for one second. The, the role of an independent chief risk officer at Fannie Mae and at most financial institutions was a relatively new role. So the rules of the road were kind of being written in real time. And what I wanted to do was to make it very clear that the, C the CRO actually not only reported to me but also reported to the board. I wanted to make it very clear in this process of coming down hard that that person was my right hand on risk, that person needed to be part of the process, that person needed to be heard, and if that person needed to discuss or report independently to the board, he or she had the ability to do so. Well, Mr. Mudd, I think the American taxpayers are the ultimate jury on whether you came down hard, and I think the record indicates you didn't come down hard. Instead, you continued the acceleration. And let me show you a presentation made to the Credit Risk Committee less than three months later on January 17th of 2007. Can we have that, please? Well, in that presentation, management proposed expending the subprime business unit in 2007 purchasing $11 billion more in subprime loans and eliminating restrictions on the volume of mortgages you could purchase with lower borrower scores and unverified incomes. So in effect, you were increasing your levels of risk rather than moderating them as your chief risk officer had recommended. And it looks to me, and I think it looks to a lot of taxpayers, like you were going in exactly the opposite direction of your risk officer's recommendations. Uh, well, no, yield back the balance but, of my sir, if I may, his, his memo, I have a serious problem with the control process around the subprime limit. So he wasn't expressing a problem with subprime as a broad issue as characterized. He was expressing a concern around the control processes, the sign-offs, the coding, the filing, and so forth. And that control process was the, was, was the subject of this discussion and of the remediation. And, and that's, that's, a, that's a separate issue than an entire broader debate that we had in the company and with the board and with the regulator and elsewhere about the subprime market in general. So I, I would just recommend it's important to keep the, the two issues somewhat separate. Well, I understand that. Yeah. But the whole purpose of having yeah. control processes in place in a company like yours is to make sure you're making rational business decisions based upon the best information available and that you're following a rational process to make those decisions. So if the control processes are not in proper working order, it prevents you from following a rational decision-making model, doesn't it? The gentleman's yes, and that's why it was important to fix them. The gentleman's time has expired. Mr. McHenry from North Carolina. I thank the new chairman and congratulations to you. Look forward to working with you. Um, we'll start with a simple yes or no question. Uh, You're not going to get that. Good luck. <laughs> good luck, I hear. Okay. <laughs> In order to fulfill your affordable housing goal, instituted and given to you by Congress, did you feel, in order to fulfill that affordable housing goal, did you feel pressure from Congress in, uh, to do riskier mortgages, perhaps more borderline mortgages? We'll, we'll start, uh, Mr. Raines, and we'll go right down the list, yes or no. I did not feel pressure from Congress. So based no. I, I'm asking, and I only have five minutes. Uh, no. Uh, you've had a long no. day, so I'm trying to. No. Uh, no. Interesting. No. 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 Mr. Mudd? No, because as the goals <laughs> went up, the goals mm. came from HUD, and meeting those HUD goals right. created pressure. Mr. Siren. Uh, as the goals went up and the goals were specified by HUD, uh, you, you inevitably, to make more progress, had to take more risk. 
Okay. So you had, in order to make more progress with your affordable housing goal, you had to take make riskier mortgages. Yes. Or, or buy riskier mortgages. Yes. Buy riskier mortgages. Okay. I think it's interesting. Uh, Mr. Siren gave, I think, something more akin to what I was accustomed to as a member of the Financial Services Committee. Um, I've seen some of you before, and I don't know if you just refused to listen to what happened in those hearings, but there was massive pressure from members of Congress on your institutions to provide more affordable housing and therefore riskier mortgages. Now, I'm not calling them riskier. Your risk officers called them riskier. Um, and in Freddie Mac's case, uh, uh, Mr. Uh, Andrew Conis wrote a memo, memo in 2004, we could call that up, uh, to push for more affordable business, I guess that's your lingo for more affordable housing, uh, an increased share means more borderline and unprofitable business will come in. The best credit enhancement is a profit margin, and ours is likely to be squeezed as we respond to these market pressures. Um, so I think it's interesting to me that in, in some respects, and by your newspaper accounts, uh, you acknowledge that there is pressure on you, uh, and obviously pressure from Congress in terms of uh, congressional efforts on HUD to raise those standards, but also on you all directly. And I think it's pretty bizarre. I mean, uh, the chairman of my committee, Financial Services, Barney Frank, said, I worry, quite frankly, there's tension here. This is from 2003. The more people, in my judgment, exaggerate a threat of safety and soundness, the more people conjure up the possibility of serious financial losses to the Treasury, which I do not see. I think we see entities that are fundamentally sound financially and uh, withstanding some of the disastrous uh, scenarios. Uh, Congresswoman Waters, who I serve with on financial services, said, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. We're still paying the price for that. But my point is, you did have pressure to meet your affordable housing goal. And that was done uh, through members of Congress. It was done through HUD. Um, and that was conflicted with your delivery for your, tax, uh, for your uh, investors uh, to produce profit. That's what your risk officer said. Do you all disagree? Mr. Raines? Uh, I disagree. In my time that I was there, I did not feel pressured from the Congress uh, to do riskier loans to meet housing goals. Our housing goals were ratcheted up administratively by HUD. Congress gave guidelines that I thought were quite reasonable to HUD. HUD, by the time I had left, was proposing to push those guidelines to a level that forced the companies to begin to entertain loans that they otherwise wouldn't have entertained. So it really was more from a regulatory standpoint than Congress. And who, who uh, funds HUD? Congress. <coughs> Let me just tell you, I hate to uh, you know, reference this, and Mr. Raines knows from his political background, but this is a political city. There was pressure from Congress. However, Congressman, at that time, I mean, just to be fair, uh, Congress was in the hands of the Republicans. So yeah. I don't think that the Republicans uh, were intending well, to you actually, force HUD you actually, to uh, ratchet up our goals to an unreasonable level. And reading from your quote in the Washington Post from yesterday, you want, you want to make this a partisan situation. No. Nope, uh, that's, uh, Congressman, that's just not correct. I said I, did, wanted, I did, wanted it not to be a partisan situation. Oh, okay. Okay. Well, that's generous of you. Um, so, and I read in the Washington Post from yesterday, that same article I just referenced, uh, what they say is people, this is a quote from the article, uh, people familiar with the matter said Freddie was being pushed by ad advocacy groups to come up with new loan products uh, to offer to low income and minority borrowers. Is that true? By advocacy groups, yes, sir. Yes. And those same advocacy groups are closely aligned with some members of Congress as well, and their voices for those advocacy groups as well. I'd, I'd be speculating to get into the. <laughs> well, I'll tell you, yes, they are. Thank you. I'm sorry, the lady, gentlewoman from Washington, return. Yes. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. You don't want to start off making mistakes, do That's you? That's exactly right. Yeah, you know, no doubt about <laughs> Thank it. I you, want Mr. to start Chairman. this thing off right. <laughs> um, gentlemen, I, I have to confess, um, 
My major concerns are going forward because the GSEs have been so uh, important uh, for low and moderate income housing in the United States for decades. Um, indeed, um, after we finally figure out how to get to the bottom of the housing crisis, which is a subject of extreme frustration, I must tell you here, uh, I think the most important decision that we could make on housing has to do with the uh, GSEs. I am very concerned about the ad hoc problem solving that is going on with respect to this crisis. Something pops up, somebody leaps on it. I certainly hope somebody is working on this one right now. Um, you have got a twin identity that absolutely fa fascinates me. On the one hand, you have got a very important, indeed the most important public mission in housing to assist low and moderate income families. On the other hand, you are like every corporation because you got shareholders. Uh, Mr. Paulson, when Fannie Mae went into uh, conservatorship, was very plain about what he thought. And I want to quote uh, from him. He said there was a, quote, consensus. I don't know what, who he meant, but a consensus that the GSEs, and here I am quoting from him, pose a systemic risk, and he went on to say government support needs to be either explicit or non-existent and structured to resolve the conflict between public and private purposes. I would like to ask each of you whether you agree with Secretary Paulson. Do you think uh, that the uh, GSE should be returned? Uh, to the entities they were before? Do you think they should be part of the government? Do you think they should be privatized? Uh, and in, in giving your answer, I would like to know if you believe that they should be GSEs, whether you would also make them exempt from local and state taxes, um, your malign uh, at the Treasury, exemption from at least certain kinds of regulations, which of course gave them uh, an advantage when competing in the private market. Why don't I start with you, Mr. Raines, because I noticed in your, your, your intent, your, your testimony that you uh, did not apparently see inherent problems and you say you, you don't think we can find a better model. Could you explain your view or is that still your view? Well, I can explain it, I think, very quickly. The systemic risk uh, to the system comes from any very large financial institutions that are highly leveraged, whether they are called GSEs or they are called insurance companies or they are called banks. Indeed, we saw in the current crisis that the uh, most troubled entities and the ones that had the most extensive impact on the financial system weren't GSEs. The biggest one is an insurance company that had never been set, uh, identified as a systemic risk. Uh, second, with regard to uh, making the government support either explicit uh, or non-existent, uh, I can agree with that. Uh, I think it can be uh, explicit uh, and not, you know, I don't think it would be possible to go back to the implicit support that was there before. Uh, and I think the market should be told what the support is and that should be it. And the investors should take the risk. On the last point on resolving the conflict between public and private purposes, I think that is laudable but impossible. And the example I would give you is a defense contractor. A defense contractor is only there to solve a pu for a public purpose. They only sell to the government. They are there for national defense. That product is not really useful anywhere else in the economy. But they are also for-profit companies. They are there to advance the interests of their shareholders. Well, would people, would, <laughs> would people invest in such a company? Uh, well, I think, I think people invest currently in, in uh, utilities, they invest currently in defense contractors, and they invest in banks who have this same conflict in, within themselves. So I you think, think that, that perhaps has to be managed. We should, treat, uh, we should treat Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac more like a utility then? I think the, the, treating them uh, more like a utility may be politically more, much more comfortable uh, than treating them uh, in the current well, form. Let, let me go on to Mr. Mudd, who, who who uh, has indicated that Freddie and Fannie are in a, quote, no man's land. Uh, and you uh, 
in your in your testimony, you advocate to make them either fully public or pro fully private. So, which which should they be, and why? Uh, the advocacy, uh, Congresswoman, is to make it clear uh, for for a long time throughout. And you don't care which it is, sir. Uh, I think that uh, at this point. I, I know a little bit more intimately the structure of the company, and there are there are different components of the company. One component, the mortgage portfolio, is a liquidity provider fundamentally. The guarantee business is fundamentally a, a securitizer. Uh, it seems clear to me now, in the history of the past six or eight months, that if there is a real crisis in the country, the liquidity provider is going to be the government. So that would give rise to a question of whether you want a private company to be a liquidity uh, provider or whether that becomes a function of the government. The other side of the business, the guarantee business that does work with lenders, provides services, does so at, at, a, at, a, at a fee, might have, another, might have another treatment. So I don't think the same answer needs to be true for all components of the company if you are going to move it out of what you aptly described as no man's land. Well, I would like to know if the other two gentlemen believe that an entirely private company could be trusted to provide the same protection to the consumer, particularly the consumers that uh, the GSAs uh, were specifically directed to help? Well, well Madam Congressman, I, I don't think, uh, excuse me, Mr. Chairman, mm -hmm. I, I don't think uh, a purely private company could generate long-term fixed-rate uh, mortgages that are prepayable just because no other country, uh, major country, uh, has one. I, th I think, as some of my colleagues have said, the most important thing in this is getting a more precise definition, whether it is a, a defense company which operates on some sort of cost plus, a utility with a specified rate of return. There needs to be less sort of swimming around mm -hmm. and more definition of no. what the shareholders can expect. M Mr. Brinsell, and then. Uh, I think one only has to look at the mortgage market of today and the mortgage market of the past uh, two or three decades, and you can see where it is that part of the market is p served by the purely private market. It doesn't work as well. It is more unstable, and you don't have the types of mortgage products that are consumer friendly. I also happen to be of the maybe the view in the minority. I don't see a fundamental conflict between the public purpose for which Freddie Mac is chartered, was chartered, and its uh, shareholder ownership. After all, we are chartered to bring stability and liquidity and availability of mortgage credit to low and moderate middle income families and use private capital to do so. It is that one mission, unique mission. So well, in what order about the shareholder the mission? What? What about the shareholder well, mission? Well, uh, in order for if the shareholders are served, they are only served by serving that mission of bringing mortgage credit to American homeowners at a uh, profitable rate, uh, but at a con uh, rate where it's the result in sound loans. Thank you very much, Thank Mr. You. Chairman. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Garrett from New Jersey. I thank the Chairman and I thank the uh, ranking member for the opportunity. I normally serve on the uh, Financial Services Committee, so I appreciate the chance to be here for a few minutes, or actually for several hours now, um, because this has been a uh, topic of most importance to me ever since I have been here for the last six years. So I appreciate your testimony and also some of the questions. One point is I appreciate the fact also that the panel is made up of members who are here with both organizations during a different years, and so therefore it is probably unfair to use a broad brush approach on any of the questions or some of the allegations that are made because you are in different spots. To the point of who is responsible, which is a lot of the questioning, and the committee is evidencing the fact that we don't feel we don't get that back from uh, the panel, let me just also say the flip si side of that on this issue just for 30 seconds, and that is this. Just as the panel had the opportunity to address a number of the questions or issues during their tenure in office and some of the questions that I will raise as well, let it not be forgotten that Congress also had the opportunity for the six years that I served and prior to that as well to address some of these issues, the systemic risk issues, uh, the operation issues, the issues as far as where you were investing and the size of the portfolio and what have you, and that was not done. So I would ask each member who is raising those questions as who is responsible to look in their mirror on this panel to see how did they vote 
both in committee and on the floor when the opportunity came for the House and in the Senate um, to rein in, create new regulations, the, the GSEs in the past. So I think there is an uh, adequate opportunity to see responsible both in the panel and this committee as well. Going to the GSEs, you make money in two different manners. One, of course, is by uh, buying up securities, packaging them, and then selling the or mortgages and then selling them. The second way, of course, is by taking um, these mortgages and putting them on your, into your portfolio. That second way, in my understanding, is eight times more lucrative or profitable than the selling of the securities. Um, the numbers in your, that I have seen is you had reached a high in 2003 of $1.5 $1 trillion worth of securities in your held uh, portfolio in 2008 went down to $1.4 trillion. And interestingly enough, on these numbers, in 05 to 07, this is what the type of securities that you were putting in there. 97 percent were interest only securities, 85 or mortgages, 85 percent were Alt A, 72 percent were negative amortization uh, mortgages, 61 or 62 percent were with FICAs under uh, 620. Obviously, these are. A, the more risky loans that were going on during the book during that time, and in general during the entire period of time for everyone, when you were expanding your portfolio, um, that was A, more profitable on the one hand, but certainly riskier on the other hand. The issues have already been raised as far as leverage ratio and the capital levels, and on this committee committed, uh, criticized Lehman for a 31 ratio, and uh, here you're leveraged at 75 to 1 ratio. One of the members of the panel said, to all these points in general, uh, and not specifically on one, that we were doing the same as our competitors. So one of my first questions will be, and I'll get to this, allow you to answer in a second, is, is it appropriate for a GSC, which is a, um, has the backing implicitly now uh, implied at the time of the government, to simply be m mirroring what the private sector is doing, or where you should have been to a higher standard in each of these areas, your, your risk model, your capital model, what you are putting in the securities as well? That will be the first question I would throw out to you. Secondly, to, to the regulation aspect, both Ms. Fox and Ms. Henry raised this point very well. And Mr. Raines, you were saying that uh, you were looking for additional regulation, and I think you made the comment in your testimony. You didn't go in full detail, but I read your full testimony. OFEO was not um, restraining uh, credit risk, but they were limited to uh, balance sheets and interest rates risk. That may be, but I can tell you that. Um, Certain members of the Financial Services Committee were looking at all those areas. And you had Secretary Snow come in before the committee and testified. You had um, um, uh, Alan Greenspan come in and testify on these points. You had Richard Baker when he was here testifying, or not testifying, but raising these points. There was a focus, at least for the six years when I was in Congress, to try to do these things. And while perhaps you did come before the committee and say that we needed regulation in the House, we know for a fact that the House regulations were a lot softer, a lot easier than the regulations that were being proposed in the Senate. And what the GSD did effectively through the lobbying mechanisms and otherwise was to kill effectively during the time the Republicans were in charge of those efforts in the uh, Senate. And what we have ended up with now is regulation, albeit late and obviously way too late, but much softer regulations than uh, should have been done uh, in the past. And uh, finally, I guess on that point, since my time is just about out, uh, to the point, you may have made the suggestion, Mr. Raines, that the problem was not a, uh, a credit problem per se, per se in the portfolios and the mortgage-backed securities, but really, wasn't it a problem? Um, and when this is when the uh, accounting irregularities came up and what have you, wasn't the problem underlined by the fact that? Um, because of the size of the portfolio and have to deal with interest rates risk, that you had to begin involved with um, um, derivatives and other uh, mechanisms in order to hedge against that, and that effectively led to some of the problems that we dealt with later on. So I guess there's three questions there, two for Mr. Raines, the rest for the panel. Let me say to the gentleman, I know you waited two hours, but your time has expired. I see the light. <laughs> hey, thank you again for the opportunity, though. I believe there sure, were two questions that were directed to me, sure. uh, one of them about regulation uh, and Fannie Mae's activities with regard to legislation and the other related to derivatives. Right. Is that correct? Yes. Sir. The, with regard to Fannie Mae and uh, uh, legislation, uh, it was always my desire, and I worked very hard but unsuccessfully, to try to get legislation passed, because I believe that if legislation was passed, then all of the political swirl around Fannie Mae would subside at least for some period of time. 
And I was an advocate, and I think if you uh, talk to uh, the, uh, uh, the chairman of the committees, uh, the relevant committees, even Mr. Baker uh, would indicate that I wanted legislation. Did we agree on all of the provisions? No. But the provisions we disagreed on did not relate to regulation. They related to our mission. There were efforts to try to constrain our mission. I oppose those. But where it came to a world-class regulator, as defined by Congressman Konjorski, and who pushed this over and over and over again, I was in favor of that. I am still in favor of it, and I am still opposed to constraining the mission of the GSEs. So I think there has been a consistency across that time. And in terms of the uh, derivatives, as you accurately point out, uh, Fannie Mae used derivatives in order uh, to uh, enable it to fund itself, uh, including its on balance sheet portfolio. And the uh, fact that Fannie Mae had to do a restatement is something that I have uh, stated over and over again that I am not only sorry for, but I hold myself accountable that, that we did not get it right, even though I was not involved in the accounting. I would point out, however, that this is not a problem that was unique to Fannie Mae. I think that was, uh, upwards of 200 companies had to have restatements around derivatives in that time period. Some of them had to do it twice before they could do it properly according to the SEC. So this, this difficulty of uh, applying the FAS 133 standard was not unique to Fannie Mae, uh, and, but it was widespread amongst financial firms during that era. With regard to derivatives, we re used derivatives at Freddie Mac uh, uh, to reduce risk. Uh, to manage uh, interest rate risk, uh, uh, and uh, we didn't use it to manage uh, credit risk uh, or the risk of default on subprime uh, mortgages, which I've, which I've already testified. Or interest rate risk? No. We used it to manage interest rate, to reduce risk, uh, to reduce interest rate risk, uh, but that it doesn't have anything to do really with the, sub, with, uh, uh, the losses that are being ta taken on uh, 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 credit risk associated with subprime mortgages. Uh, I guess for the purpose of time, I would just address the, the, um, the risk question and the standards question. And I, I think in the context of the, uh, of the Alt A book, the ultimate measure there is the performance, and the performance of the Alt-A loans that Fannie Mae guaranteed has been a factor of two better than the market. The FICOs were higher, the credit scores were higher, the loan to values were higher, the quality. Was it ultimately good enough that, 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 it, that it matched or exceeded the performance of the, the other 85 percent of the book, which is the old standard fixed rate mortgage? No, that is a reflection of the, of the change in the, in, in the marketplace. Uh, was there a role uh, for the companies in terms of standard setting? Yes, Congressman. I think that expressly uh, uh, defines what we were talking about earlier about relevance. You can't set any standards whatsoever if you are irrelevant to the market because you are offering products that nobody wants. Uh, Mr. Congressman, I will try to quickly answer two of the questions. Uh, one, should we have the same capital standards? Uh, not we anymore, but should there be the same? Should there be the same capital standards? And I think that depends on the degree of the guarantee. Uh, I have sympathy for your argument that if there is an explicit guarantee uh, for the GSEs and not for other competing financial institutions, then maybe there is an argument for higher capital. Uh, to, to protect the public. I think the reverse situation actually may uh, apply now. And second is in terms of uh, the uh, willingness to take risk and uh, where things were. Actually, if you look at <coughs> the latest uh, Mortgage Bankers Association figures on delinquencies, they show for the country as a, as, excuse me, for the industry as a whole, 4.9 percent, and for Freddie Mac, 0 0.8 percent. So I in terms of Far from perfect, but the the the, the level of delinquencies uh, about six times greater uh, for the industry than for Freddie Mac. Thank you very much, um, gentleman from Maryland, Mr. Sarbanes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you all. You've been uh, you've demonstrated extraordinary stamina here today. We've been here for four hours, one of the longest panels we've had over the last couple of years. But I think it. It reflects the level of interest there is on the part of the committee. I wanted to ask if you, and anyone can take a shot at this, but talk about the 
the distinction, I'm going to put this into layperson's terms, but the distinction between a good risky loan and a bad risky loan, because you've, you've talked about how there was pressure from HUD, let's say, to make sure that the affordable housing targets were being met and so forth. But certainly that wasn't, a, that wasn't an instruction to go find or buy um, or become entangled with, with the kinds of loans where all, all manner of, of uh, conventional underwriting standards have been abandoned. So I'm curious to know how you would describe what was presented to you. I mean, were you looking into a stew of of good risky loans and bad risky loans, if we want to suggest that all of the ones that would take you into the more affordable housing arena would be ca characterized as risky, um, certainly your obligation to continue to differentiate between the ones that were, were extra risky or bad versus the ones that were good, that obligation should never have been surrendered. So anybody can speak to that if they like. Talk, start with you, Mr. Rains. Well, Congressman, I, I like your, your uh, division between good risky loans and bad risky loans because all loans are risky. Uh, they all have some level of risk to them, and uh, it's important to be able to measure that risk and manage it. When seeking to uh, push the envelope of those who have access to home ownership, uh, I think this is an important distinction. Uh, we tried very hard to come up with loan products that we thought uh, help to uh, make housing affordable uh, and available without layering in uh, so many things that the risk was unacceptable. So, for example, if someone had good credit and they had a good steady income, but they didn't have much in the way of savings, we would have a low down payment product. If someone uh, had uh, uh, a, uh, a, a, a good credit, uh, but uh, I mean, had, had marginal credit, but had substantial savings, uh, we might say, well, we will take on that marginal credit because they have offset it by having substantial uh, savings that they can put into a down payment. And so it is the layering of these factors. When you put together negative amortization, interest only, no documentation, uh, low down payment, bad credit, that layering on gets you into bad risky loans. Those are loans that is, almost no one knows how they are going to perform, but you can assume it will be pretty bad. And uh, so trying to figure out what that line is, when do you cross the line between acceptable risk that are, that's advancing affordable housing and unacceptable risk that's putting uh, families at, uh, at severe risk to their futures, that's the art. No one can tell you exactly where that line is, but what the, the policies that we tried to uh, follow when I was uh, leading the company was keep experimenting. Do small experiments, none that can cause you a lot of harm if they go bad, but keep trying. Try this, try that. If it doesn't work, stop. If it does work, then double down and, and do more. And well, with that approach, Mike, we tried okay, to manage Let me risk. go to your tenure because um, Fannie Mae was purchasing more of these loans that appeared to have departed from the conventional underwriting standards. Is that because you couldn't distinguish from a less risky loan or what was happening there? Uh, what happened was that the, the, market, the, the, the market migrated uh, to a wider range of loans with a wider range of features that, that Mr. Raines pointed out. It was driven by a multiplicity of factors that, that, that we could go into, but they certainly included the rising cost of a home. They certainly included the technology ability from lenders and servicers to offer more choices and more complicated uh, uh, products to individuals. So, so I, I agree with what he said that the, a number of features uh, would would take a risky loan and turn it into a bad risky loan, um, and th those would go to those would go to features that could un put an unwary borrower into a difficult situation. Negative amortization was, was mentioned. Prepayment penalties could be mentioned, required insurance, those type of things. But to me, just stepping back for one second from a policy perspective, one of the starting points uh, might ought to be disclosure where all of us, when we get a mortgage, see a front page that says, here's your rate, here's the maximum rate you might ever pay, 
here's your monthly payment, here's the maximum monthly payment mm -hmm. you might ever pay, and that there be kind of a moment of truth between the originator and the borrower to make sure they understand what they're right, getting. Let into. me just, because this will be a 15 second question, Mr. Chairman. Um, and it, but it's really a question I've had in all these hearings um, because it's not the case, and as, if, I'm, if I'm listening as, as a member of the public, it's never been the case in these hearings that anyone has suggested that there weren't warnings and that's why all this stuff happened. It's always been the case that we have plenty of testimony that there were warnings, but they were not heeded. And I'm not going to ask you to, to comment on why you didn't heed warnings within your own um, companies, within your own organizations. I'm going to ask you this. What does one do as a corporation? In other words, because it was in your interest not to get in. I mean, we talk about the effect on the public, but obviously you would have preferred that this didn't happen to Fannie Mae or Freddie Mac, and so would all those other companies that have gone down the tank. What do you do inside an organization to make sure that the people that are raising the warnings can somehow impact the decisions that are being made? Because it seems if I was a risk analyst from this period of time, I would be going through an existential crisis right now. Like, what, what purpose are they serving? How do you protect their ability to sound the alarm and give it the kind of credence that might have changed the course of all of this? So I'll give it to anybody who wants to, to answer Well, that. my answer would be that you have to create a culture that enables those people to get their voice heard. And, and in, a, in a corporation, it doesn't mean that somebody always gets their way, That but, but j just like I, I suppose in Congress a legislative assistant doesn't get to decide what the member does. The chief risk officer doesn't always get to decide what the CEO does. But you have to make sure that all those voices are a part of the debate and that people have a view, no matter what their level or their rank or their position or their tenure in the company, have the ability to get their voice heard, get it considered, be respected. And sometimes they're right, sometimes they're wrong, sometimes you're right, sometimes you're wrong. But you have to have that culture where you don't get a, a reinforcement of the wrong decision. That, that, that would be my experience, Congressman. Thank you very much. Uh, the gentlewoman from California, Ms. Speer. Mr. Chairman, thank you. And thank you to the members of our panel. Let me just ask a couple of really brief questions and then get to uh, the core question I want to ask. Are any of you now employed by the financial services industry? And. In, in each of your cases, was your compensation in any way, whether it was bonus or stock options or salary, um, linked to the volume that was generated by the company? We had a balanced scorecard, and I have been racking my mind going through here whether share uh, was uh, any part of that. So in, indirectly, uh, there, there may have been, but I don't, I don't directly recall. Okay. Mr. Mudd. We, we had a, a parallel process where there were a number of different objectives that needed to be a, needed needed to occur, and one of those was certainly revenues, which would tie to your question. So there was a linkage. Revenues were were a, were a component of the overall consideration for for right. bonuses, particularly yes. Mr. Brenzel, there were many. Uh, first of all, my compensation was set by the board of directors. Uh, and evaluated it annually in my bonuses and so forth. And they considered uh, many factors, uh, certainly the profitability of the company, but also uh, the capitalization, the safety and soundness, uh, uh, the risk profile, uh, whether or not there were too many uh, uh, mortgage delinquencies or defaults. And so uh, um, I always felt uh, that my compensation uh, was not at all linked to uh, volume right. generated Thank you. by the company. Mr. Raines. Uh, I, as I testified before, I don't believe that volume it's played a role in the formula when I was there, but profitability did, uh, and uh, sometimes market share vis a vis Freddie Mac did. Uh, but volume by itself was not a factor, as All I right. recall. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Mudd, I am referring now to an October 5, uh, 2008 New York Times article that focused on an exchange between you and Mr. Mazzillo, uh, formerly the head of Countrywide. And the article quotes Mr. Mazzillo as telling you, uh, you are becoming irrelevant. You need us more than we need you, and if you don't take these loans, you will find you can lose much more. In fact, I think you flew to California to have that conversation with him. Can you please describe for the record the exchange you had with Mr. Mazzillo? 
Um, I can't because I don't remember that exchange at all. Uh, we, uh, I did look back through my records in preparation for the hearing, and I had a number of meetings with Countrywide. I had a number of meetings with Mozilla, as I did with, with, with all of our key customers. Um, as it was described in the paper, that certainly would have been a memorable meeting, but it doesn't, it doesn't trigger my memory. Uh, certainly, uh, uh, with him as well as with other, with other customers, uh, there was a, uh, a, a back and forth in terms of what was our eligibility, what was our pricing, what was our credit standard, what was the value of our guarantee, what was our pricing versus Freddie Mac, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But that specific conversation, I, I, I can't You don't I can't remember him offering you a breath mint at the end I, of the No, I, I, All right. I, I, I uh, don't remember let's that Let's move either. on. <laughs> uh, there is a presentation from June 2005 titled Facing Strategic Crossroads. This presentation discusses how Fannie is losing market share to Wall Street. The slide is on page 27 and says, primary market originations of products outside Fannie Mae's traditional risk appetite are on the rise. Then the slide on page 32 says, quote, this trend is increasingly costing us with our largest customer. Now, as the slide shows, your largest customer was countrywide. Isn't that right? Yes. Did you lower your standards to accommodate the riskier loans from countrywide? No, uh, we, we established a set of uh, standards. We had a debate that I have described in the course of the hearing that, that, that said the, um, the core uh, Fannie Mae business uh, uh, with all of its very attrib attributes was, was shrinking and our market share on that note had gone, I think, from 40 percent to about 20 percent. Meanwhile, the market for alternative products had gone from something like 10 percent up to, up to 40 percent. So it was clear that there had been a, a change in the marketplace that if our lenders, our seller servicers and others wanted to go around us to some uh, a different form of securitization, which typically was a, was a rating agency sizing uh, set up and distributed through Wall Street, they had that alternative. And the continuation of, of a market share trend that goes 40-20 is, is, is obviously quite low. Uh, so we, we, we made a prudent effort to figure out what we could do to recapture that, uh, that business. And obviously with Countrywide as one of the largest originators, they were part of that overall effort as were other major financial institutions. Well, the documents the committee has received appears that the Alt A mortgages that Fannie Mae brought between 2005 and 2007 in large measure from Countrywide had riskier terms and higher delinquency rates, and they contributed to more than 40 percent of Fannie's credit losses last quarter. So I'm, my time is up, but I think it is um, interesting that in the end you did expand your um, portfolio of countrywide loans, and it has in this last quarter created quite a bit of heartburn within Fannie Mae. I, I think the Alt-A loans, just to be clear, I think that is a representation of Alt-A losses as a total percentage of the book rather than countrywide, al although I think countrywide would probably be a component of that total number. Right. Thank you very much. Um, let me Chair, just say, yes. I, I want to ask your indulgence on something. You were able to give Mr. Shays one extra minute. He is leaving the committee. Mr. Sally is about to leave us also, and he had one uh, very, very important point he would like to make that has not been made today. It is not a repeat of anything, and I okay. wondered if you would just with one more minute. Be delighted to do Thank so. You so much. Especially Thank being he is leaving. Yes. Thank, Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <laughs> Last time I will bother you. <laughs> um, Let us see. This, this would be for uh, Mr. Siren, I guess. And I believe you should have a document that looks like this in front of you. Um, and I assume you understand what that credit policy and portfolio management department uh, report uh, deals with uh, for Freddie Mac. I'm looking on that second page. There is under priority number five. And if you go over to the right side of the page, there are four bullets there. And the third one talks about additional affordable type programs being considered. And in that third line, it, it talks about programs apparently for illegal immigrants. And I'm wondering if you could describe uh, what that proposed program was was about. You know, why would a government-sponsored 
enterprise want to engage in something like that? You know, was it implemented in any way? You know, so how many loans were given? How many defaulted? Those kinds of things. Can you give me an idea uh, what that program was about? You know, I'm saying this right. uh, time in some substantial period of time. Fourth, and unfortunately, along with I really. Mm. I'm sorry. Fine. Hey, Mike. I'm saying this for the first time in some period of time, and unfortunately, I I, I don't remember. Uh, Is that something you could provide in a written form for the committee? Just yeah, yes, sir. The the description there uh, yes, that sir. I asked for. That if if they if it was ever implemented, how many loans were there? What yes, was ready to default and those kinds of things. Uh, Mr. Chairman, with that, I have uh, uh, one question that is in writing, and I'd ask unanimous consent to submit that to all the witnesses uh, for a written response. When the objection so ordered. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Right. Thank, you Thank you very you much. So Thank much. Thank you. Thank you. Let me thank all of the witnesses, of course, for your testimony. We really appreciate the time uh, uh, that you've shared with us today. And, of course, we look forward to uh, continuing to work with you because, as you know, uh, uh, there's a lot of things here that need to be fixed. And I think we all agree on that. In terms, so we need to sort of work to make certain uh, that we do. Uh, so thank you very much for coming, and thank you very much for your testimony. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Thank you. We will take a five-minute recess before we go into our second panel. And then, of course, after that, we will swear them in, receive their testimony. So a five-minute recess. The second panel. You can watch the rest of this hearing and other Capitol Hill events we cover at our website, cspan.org. Tomorrow, the House Financial Service.